It's because the banks had to be recapitalized. You had to uh, introduce schemes uh, to make sure there was sufficient liquidity in the system, enough money to go around. But the key point and the key difference uh, between then and now is that from day one, the government wanted to get the economy going again. And therefore, we introduced a range of measures uh, which um, enabled us to do that. Um, the situation today is different in that, firstly, it is part of government policy right across the world, and rightly so, to actually suppress economic activity through the lockdown and other measures. So we're not yet in a position where we're saying, look, we're going to pull out all the stops and get the economy uh, growing again. Uh, and I think the other thing that I would just make a preliminary comment I'd make is that you can't distinguish uh, between the problems we have in relation to health and the problems that we have and are going to have in relation to the economy. The two are interlinked. Unless and until the government gets control of the virus itself and the spread of the virus, it's difficult to see how you can, as I say, pull out the stops and get the economy going again because people will be fearful about going out. There's always a risk of the sec a second wave and so on. Where there is a similarity, I think, comes in, it will come in the, you know, the coming uh, weeks and months. And that is the economy having contracted so much so quickly, and we're undoubtedly you know, in a recession now, and the situation is, um, is similar in most other parts of the world. The government will need to introduce measures, firstly to deal with a wave of unemployment, which I think will come once the furlough system starts being uh, phased out, and also uh, to make sure that people who are displaced uh, from the, the workplace, who lose their jobs, that we can get them back into work as quickly as possible. Uh, and in addition to that, I think it would be necessary for the government to, uh, to make sure that you don't end up with a recession becoming a depression. Now, all these things you know, we did 10 years ago, many of the measures actually do uh, bear repeating, like a temporary VAT cut, maybe the car scrappage scheme, uh, you know, time to pay taxes will continue and so on. But I think it's important to recognize that there are differences between the two. And as I say, the key difference is we're not yet ready to say to people, look, let's do everything we possibly can, because you know, there is still that, the fear that the virus will spread. And frankly, unless and until we get testing uh, properly operating, which we haven't yet, I don't see that happening. Hey, Alistair, thank you. Uh, George, can I go to you? I, I think you might, and I, I, I say might, have a different view as to whether this crisis is, is actually going to be worse than the financial crisis. And I'd be interested in your thoughts, particularly on that aspect. Yeah, it is good to be back before the committee. Um, and the short answer is no one knows, but I am uh, more optimistic, I think, than Alistair. Uh, if you look at the history of pandemics and plagues and the like in our in our society, that the economic bounce back has tended to be relatively rapid. If you look at the history of banking crises throughout our history, uh, not just the one 10 years ago, but in the 1920s and 30s, and then in the 19th century and before, recoveries are very slow and protracted and painful um, because the credit channels of the economy are impaired and despite all the work that Alistair did and I did to try and unclog those channels it, it takes a long time for the allocation of capital to get back to you know the efficiency it has before the banking crash. Um, with the pandemic uh, we've obviously had a very sharp fall in GDP which we're experiencing right now in this quarter uh, much greater actually than the one that happened in 2008 and 9. Um, but I think the recovery will be more rapid, and that is uh, certainly what the forecasts are showing. And so, you know, the if you like the area under the graph, the, the sort of total loss of output will be less uh, than in the banking crash. I think it will, however, um, have this feature which Alistair touched on, and which thankfully was avoided, and you can judge whether it was the skill of the administrations that we were both part of, or, uh, you know, good luck or whatever. We didn't really have to deal with mass unemployment in the UK. We had a very flexible labour market. Unemployment did rise in kind of 08, 09, 2010, but it did, you know, we never faced the kind of structural unemployment that we saw in the 1980s when I was a child. Um, and I think the kind of challenge here is the overall economy might look to have recovered. Indeed, that's where equity markets at the moment are racing. Uh, and and the kind of overall GDP might look like it's back. Uh, and the overall loss of GDP might be less than in 2008, 9. 
but but there may be a large number of human casualties out there uh, in the in the process because essentially governments, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England have stepped in on such a great scale that, that, that it's almost as the sort of laws of maths say the GDP has got to come back and certainly this, they're the biggest purchases out there in equity markets at the moment. Uh, but of course, there'll be loads of people in businesses that have gone bust that aren't going to return uh, and people who are unemployed, uh, and, uh, you know, coming off furloughs into unemployment. And that is going to be a big social challenge. Uh, and, and of course, economic challenge for this government. So I think the, it will be different. I think, you know, one kind of lesson I would draw from my time, and obviously I, I, I came in after the immediate crisis in the recovery, is you do need to then, having put in your emergency measures, you do need to set a path on how you're going to exit them. You need to give the country, business, markets, uh, a future direction. And, 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 and I think that is what, from what I can see, uh, Rishi Sunak is now sort of pivoting towards uh, after the emergency. And I think the more you can do that, the more confidence people will have in the UK and the more confidence people in the UK will have to start their business, a new business again, to go and look for work uh, and, and, uh, and to be taken on uh, as well. George, thank you very much for that. And turn now to Philip, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, in terms of which is the worst, I think it, it is too early to say yet, because a lot is going to depend on whether uh, over the next uh, months it becomes clear that we are heading towards either a vaccine and or a treatment for this disease, and that the future trajectory is one of returning the economy to something like normal, or whether by contrast, that we are not heading towards an early development of a vaccine or a treatment, and we have to plan in terms of restarting the economy, living with COVID, uh, and restructuring our economy, restructuring individual businesses to be able to operate in an economically suboptimal uh, way um, while living with the presence uh, of the disease. Um, so I think we, it, it would be um, premature to say at the moment which of these is going to lead, which of these two events is going to lead to the greatest level of total loss of output. My guess is that in any scenario, because the um, decline in output has been so dramatic uh, over the last few months, the first part of the recovery will look quite like a quite sharp uh, V-shape. Um, but the real question is, what does the last part of the recovery look like? Um, once we get back to, you know, a loss of output of quotes only um, six percent, how, how do we how do we make that last bit back up? Is it a steep curve or is it a long, um, shallow curve? Um, uh, George made the point uh, quite rightly that um, the damage to the financial system in the financial crisis created some structural impediments in the recovery. Um, and it's too early yet to say whether any parts of the economy will be structurally damaged in a way um, that has a lasting effect. Although clearly the banking system itself um, at the moment uh, does not appear to have been um, significantly impacted uh, by the crisis in a way that's likely to uh, affect the shape of the recovery. And um, Alistair made the point, which I think is very important, is that in this um, situation over the last few months, um, what we are dealing with is, is, a, is an economy in which supply has been deliberately suppressed by, uh, you know, as a matter of public policy. Um, so we're not yet at the stage where stimulating demand is the answer to the economy's problems, because we've got an economy that is locked down on the supply side. Uh, the, the challenge for the Chancellor is going to be to manage these two huge moving parts um, in synchronization as the economy comes back to life. So that as the, the clamps are taken off the supply side of the economy and, and, and output uh, begins to um, uh, resume, uh, that we make sure that, that the effective demand is, is there. And that's when um, the Chancellor will want to look at measures uh, to support demand. 
Philip, thank you. Can I just go back to you, George, uh, for a second? So I think we're all agreed that uh, a major driver of how bad this crisis is, is what happens on the health front. When do we get a vaccine? When can we go back to normal, near normal? Um, but whenever it arrives at whatever point, um, what are the main levers that you think that government should be pulling here in terms of assuring a, a good recovery afterwards, particularly around the issue of jobs, where clearly in the financial crisis that was less of an issue, but is going to be inevitably, whatever happens, a very major uh, element of what's going on here? Yeah, and no, I, uh, I think the sort of central challenge is going to be in the, over the next year, if, if you if you look at the sort of short to medium term, is how do you withdraw some of the very necessary and uh, and by, in my case fully supported um, schemes to have kept people in work and businesses afloat during the crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, because you know, it, and this is a very hard judgment that the government has to make. The furlough scheme has been absolutely essential for keeping people in work who otherwise would be made unemployed. And many of the people on furlough are gonna go back to their jobs. You know, when the restaurant reopens, the job will be there because, uh, you know, um, people, the rest will start to serve food. But we have to be honest and say that quite a lot of those businesses will not come back. The restaurant may not need as many staff as it did. Uh, and indeed, you know, frankly, quite a lot of businesses have used the furlough anyway for a, a sort of permanent efficiency cut as, as, as you know business would put it um and, and 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 sort of trapping people on a scheme that is that is generous to them in the short term but actually prevents them re-entering the labor force to get the new job they need is uh is is, is you know potentially very damaging so i i think kind of the withdrawal of the furlough is going to be difficult important for employment in the in the short term and um, and at the same time, we might come on to this. Actually, some of the some of these loans to businesses that are never coming back is, are going to become an issue. You know, essentially keeping zombie companies on life support. Mm -hmm. Again, that's not right an issue for right now because we're right in the middle of the crisis and we don't know, you know, exactly what the shape of the um, society is going to look like and when the vaccines are coming. So, but then beyond that, look, I think you, government can do a huge amount to create you know, good employment schemes. But let's be honest, governments of all colors since the Second World War have not done terribly well at getting structurally unemployed, people in sort of structural unemployment back to work. And they've often in the end been sort of popped off and this is a sort of tragedy onto various benefits that um, kind of recognize their condition as permanently unemployed. Um, and they don't, they're not, it's not always called unemployment benefit, but that's in practice what has happened. Uh, since in, in the last 50 years. So getting a kind of, here, you know, with a short-term shock, getting people back into the labor market, uh, making sure they're not out for a long time, sitting on a furlough or sitting on unemployment benefit is critical. Government has a big role. And then the second thing, you know, I would say this is you have to then give business the confidence that the future is, you know, going to be a, a, a friendly one and that therefore they have the they'll take the risk of taking people on you know you need the private sector ultimately to to have the confidence to go and employ again yeah could i just quickly pick up on one, one point you made there george about uh corporate indebtedness as we come out of this which is going to be critical because as i think you're suggesting if um companies are loaded up with debt then they're not really making the investments that they need to make to help grow the economy and create the jobs that we need. But it seems to me there are two types of businesses, the very big ones that are strategically important and the government can kind of cherry pick their targets from the centre on those, perhaps airlines, steelworks, car manufacturers, etc. But there's a huge mass of companies that have taken on civils, loans, etc, billions of pounds worth of debt that we're also going to be relying upon. What do you think is the vehicle or the mechanism by which we might be able to reach out to those businesses and take away some of the um, onerous aspects of that debt so that they can get on with growing their businesses. How does that actually work to work, given that some of those companies will actually be relatively small? Yeah, I think there's a whole separate issue about what you do with these large stakes. We're going to take in large companies like airlines and yeah. uh, potentially and, uh, and the like and, and aerospace manufacturers and so on. I mean, you know, I think all of us have the experience on this panel of 
you know, pretending that you're managing these bank holdings that we had in, in the last decade at arm's length through UKFI and now UKGI. And still when treasury questions came up or we were before the treasury select committee, you know, we were being asked about the bonuses being paid to the uh, chief executive, why branches were being closed in the constituencies of members and so on. And I can imagine an airline, you know, say it wants to shut an uneconomic route to some one of the further far flung parts of the UK. And then, you know, in Parliament, people asking the Prime Minister and Chancellor and others, well, why are you, you know, we own part of this airline, why, why are we going to close it up? So, you know, I, I think that's going to be more problematic than, than probably, you know, people realise at the moment. On the small loans, smaller loans, you know, the only, uh, I mean, I think, I genuinely think uh, uh, the Chancellor's done a very good job uh, over the last couple of months. And the only area where I disagreed with him was, I thought it was not necessary for the commercial banks to take a stake in some of these loans, you know, because that was delaying getting the money out of the door. And he then created the bounce back loan scheme um, for the smaller businesses. I think that, you know, it, it, this will be again, something the treasury officials will hate and it will kind of offend moral hazard. But there comes a point where in the, it's for the overall good of the country that you write off some of those debts, even if they score as a loss, Mm -hmm. on the government's balance sheet uh you know in, in a couple of years time the you know the the corporate sector owes a lot of money particularly the small and medium you know the micro businesses small businesses you know who are engines of growth and can be completely um you know held back by a large credit burden you know i think their government would should look at some kind of debt forgiveness now we never managed this you know in, on a big scale in in the financial crisis and its aftermath. Although, you know, I think people looking back at that period of sort of 2009, 10, 11, 12, you know, if, you, if somehow the world could have arranged a, a kind of big collective debt forgiveness, I think we would all, as, a, as a, you know, the advanced economies of the world would have recovered more quickly. And certainly in the UK, for this, particularly as it's the small business sector, uh, in, you know, in, in some point in the next couple of years, if there are loans that are just not going to be paid back, you either write them off or, in fact, what I practice will happen, I suspect, is every six months or a year, the Chancellor of the time announces that they, you know, the terms of the, the lending terms are pushed out, the rates are kept very low and so on. So, in, But but they still sit on the, on, the, on the company balance sheet and it would actually be better, a big act of debt forgiveness. Um, because after all, you know, we lent to keep these countries going while we deliberately shut down the economy. As, um, as Alistair yeah. was saying. Right, George, thank you very much. Can I uh, turn now to Felicity, please? Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your time. I know how busy you are. My questions are on taxation. I only have 12 minutes, so if we can keep answers quite brief. Now, there's an argument at the moment to say that we need to cut taxes to stimulate the economy. But there is a counter argument which says that because we're running up so much debt, we should potentially consider increasing taxes. What's your view? Let me come to Alistair first, please. Okay, I'll obey your uh, injunction. To <laughs> just let me just say one thing. There is so much uncertainty about it at the moment. If I was in the Treasury just now, I would be planning for all sorts of eventualities. I hope that my pessimism is not justified. All I'll say is that 10 years ago, when I said that I thought that then crisis would be rather long, more long lasting than people thought, it wasn't greeted with universal praise, but actually it did turn out that way. So I do been on the pessimistic side. On your tax point, I don't think you need to be, you know, if you want to stimulate the economy, the most obvious thing to do is do a time limited VAT reduction. Uh, we did it 10 years ago, and you know, I think the evidence is that it did some, some, has some effect. I'm not sure about cutting income taxes. I mean, I'm, I, I don't think that's really, uh, it, it would make a difference between people going out to work longer or doing, doing second jobs or anything like that. Um, rather, I think the, the challenge will be if people can't get into jobs, what are you doing to try and create jobs? And I take all George's points about difficulties that governments have had, but we're in a situation just now for the first time in nearly 30 years where, you know, the labour market is likely to be much, much tighter for reasons that we know. On the, when we get to the happy day, when we're uh, recovering, uh, 
uh, and on the path to recovery. Um, my view is quite clear. Yes, we are going to have very high debts, like we had at the end of the Second World War. But one of the things a government like ours can do, which because we're you know we're a large economy, uh, no one doubts our creditworthiness. You can actually carry that for some period. And what I would what I'd be very concerned about is if we got ourselves into a situation where if you're like in the recovery stage, you start clamping down things prematurely and you drive the, you, you stop the, the growth, whatever it is, and you drive the country back into, you know, a, a re recession. Remember at the beginning of this year, our economy was scheduled only to grow at just over 1%. And, you know, no, we're not going to discuss Brexit, I, I'm quite sure today, but you've got that, you know, we don't know what, fully what the effect of that will be. It depends on whether there's a deal or not. So I, 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 I am in no doubt, and, you know, just for the avoidance of doubt here, at some stage, if you're spending lots of money, you've got to pay for it. But the best way of getting tax receipts is to get your economy going again, which is why I t tend to the view that we're probably going to have to carry much higher levels of debt than we'd ever have envis envisaged in uh, you know, in any of our lifetimes for a bit longer uh, than uh, people might think. Thank you. Now, those high levels of debt are clearly possible at the moment with low interest rates. Are you concerned, however, that over a period of time, when interest rates may creep up again over a longer period of time, that the debt is not sustainable? There's always that risk, although the UK, you know, it borrows at a much longer term than most other countries. You know, our average uh, um, uh, loans, if I remember rightly, are about uh, 14, 15 years, whereas, in, you know, the rest of the G7, they're probably half that. Uh, and, you know, it, you know, there's, I think if you look at what people are saying generally, what markets are saying, I think the evidence is that, uh, or the, you know, the, that loans, the interest rates are going to be pretty low for some time. So it's not an immediate concern of mine. My bigger concern is that if you attempt to repair the damage that's been caused, you know, over the last few months and over the next few months, if you try and do it prematurely or too sharply, you will cause more problems than you solve. Thank you. Uh, can I come to Philip next on that question? Increase or decrease taxes? Well, certainly, uh, I don't think there's any economic logic to increasing taxes in the short term. I think we all accept uh, that the UK is a, a credit worthy, um, mature, very large economy can carry more debt in, in the context of a short term uh, crisis. Of course, we have to remember that um, debt is cumulative by its nature. We increased our debt very substantially during the course of dealing with the last crisis. Um, and we'd only just got back to the point where we were starting to see um, debt very, very slightly um, decline as a share of GDP. Um, now we're going to see it uh, increase significantly again as a share of um, GDP. So as Alistair said, eventually we have to think about how we manage um, the challenge of debt in the long term. But the point of um, fiscal management, I think all three of us would agree on this, is that when you can, um, you, make, uh, you, you make progress on rebalancing uh, the fiscal balance sheet. But um, the point is to have firepower available when you need it. Clearly now we need it. So I don't, I don't think you'll find anybody seriously advocating increases in taxes at the moment. The question is, as we move into um, uh, more deeply into the recovery phase, um, then there may be a need for some short term uh, fiscal stimulus to the economy, and that could be delivered um, uh, most obviously through uh, tax cuts. Alistair suggested a uh, VAT cut. Um, but, I, but I think the question is about the timing of when to go into these stimulus measures and when to come out of them. Um, and this is going to be quite a uh, carefully balanced, I think, for the Chancellor, precisely because um, we're unlocking the economy and we don't yet know where demand, uh, what, what level demand will be at. That will be a function of uh, people's confidence. It will be a function of unemployment levels. It will be a function of perceptions about the future trajectory of unemployment, even if unemployment is doesn't immediately rise sharply, if people fear that over the next six, nine, 12 months, they may lose their jobs. 
they will certainly be reluctant, reluctant, for example, to take on consumer finance or to make big ticket purchases. And uh, in those circumstances, sort of short term targeted stimulus measures um, may be the right prescription. I think the Chancellor should be open minded um, about this in the short term. And Philip, do you think that there comes a point that we should be concerned about debt sustainability? We obviously had a guilt auction that almost failed a few months ago. Yeah, I think as, uh, as Alistair's already said, um, the UK has uh, some significant advantages. We have um, much longer tenor on our public debt than, than in any other country, so we have more stability. Um, and we're not, that means we're not immediately affected by short term changes in interest rates. But it would be um, a mistake to think that just because interest rates are low now, over the very long term, they're necessarily um, remaining low. But I think the point is that we've got time to sort the debt um, situation out. I personally wouldn't be comfortable with a strategy that said we're, we're happy for debt to run to 100 plus percent of GDP and just to leave it there forever. Um, but I would absolutely accept that in the recovery phase, the next two years, um, uh, where the debt is as a percentage of GDP is not the primary concern we should be addressing. Thank you. And George, can I come finally to you, showing that there is no favouritism to my constituent? <laughs> yes, I think um, you know, you'll, you'll find a high degree of um, agreement here amongst the, the three of us. Uh, I you know, we're still in the crisis. I think the question then comes in the recovery. And the recovery might either be through the, you know, the discovery of a vaccine or a treatment, or it might be that we all you know, learn to live as a society with this uh, virus and, and accept the sort of risks uh, and, and make adjustments to the way we do business. And, and, and that's then the crucial question. There, at that point, two things are true. One is the country is poorer than it would otherwise have been. Uh, and that is a basic truth. And we have a, an elected House of Commons, and we have had one for many hundreds of years, to make that judgment then of given the size of the country's economy, what is the right amount of money we're going to raise in taxes in order to fund our public services? And, and we are just going to have to confront as a nation the fact, and other nations have to do the same thing, uh, that uh, sadly, you know, we are poorer than we thought we were, and either we're going to have to ra raise more in revenue or spend less than we were planning. Um, that that's the kind of first central and obvious point. And the second one is we don't know what's going to happen next. You know, uh, we we all live through in different forms. Uh, I was Alistair's shadow, and uh, and Philip was a shadow chief secretary. You know, we all live through the financial crash. And I remember at the time, everyone saying it's a once in a hundred year event, and we, you know, it's never going to happen again. And and here we are 10 years later talking about an event that, you know, you know saying is, and, and Alistair was just saying is, you know, worse than the financial crash. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what the world holds in the future. If we're in recovery and, you know, the, we're either living with the virus or there is a vaccine and we are running a 15% budget deficit, which we might well be, then uh, how, how comfortable are we carrying that deficit forward over the coming years. I'm not here talking about the stock of debt and, the, you know, countries are rich and have credibility in the markets like the UK precisely so we can borrow for these extraordinary events. But then you face the challenge that I faced, uh, which is how do you start to get back into balance? And you can argue about the pace of you, you do that. Alistair and I used to argue about it. And I think the history books now suggest that I ended up following pretty much the path that he he he, he mapped out because things ended up you know coming along. But nevertheless, both of us were on a path of fiscal consolidation, um, and and that is going to now you can you don't have to call it austerity. You don't have to you know tell the public you're doing it. You can try and get away with it as a government and pretend you're not doing with it. But the truth is. You're going to have to, and Parliament is going to have to make judgments about levels of tax and levels of spending. And, you know, I raised VAT, as indeed I think Alistair would have raised if VAT if he had got re-elected in 2010, um, because we had to take big steps to repair the public finances. And the only thing I would end on here, first is you can talk as much as you like about taxing billionaires and taxing tech companies and all those things, and they all, it all adds up and helps. 
but the big money raisers, you know, your income taxes, your national insurances, your VATs, those big central taxes that government relies on. Uh, and, you know, those are, that's why there's, I see now, speculation about national insurance. So, um, you know, you, to say, you know, we're just going to get the billionaires to pay for it is, is a cop out from the real questions that both government and opposition have to confront. Thank you. I'm just being told I'm out of time. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, uh, George. Can I just quickly come in on that, George? So uh, you're right, the big uh, heavy lifters for tax are the three that you've mentioned. The Conservative Party manifesto says that the rates won't be increased. Are we going to have to break the manifesto? Is the party going to have to break the manifesto in your view? Well, I've, uh, thankfully, I don't write manifestos anymore or indeed have to abide by them. <laughs> the, um, I, look, I, well, I don't know whether... Look, I'm sure the, gov the, part, the government will do everything. My, the part, I'm still, a, of course, a member of the Conservative Party. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure they will do everything they can to hold to the manifesto. All I would say is, you know, the world the government was elected in in December 2019 is completely different from the world of June 2020. And all this conversation of going back, when we get back, it's not, it's going to be a different future. And this government was elected to do a number of things like, uh, you know, obviously get Brexit done as they would put it and um, level up in the North, which I'm very keen on as an agenda uh, in the Northern powerhouse. But you know, the truth is economics has come back centre stage as it always has a habit of doing in British politics. And anyone who thought that this isn't going to be a parliament completely dominated by the economic recovery, the public finances, debt, deficit, levels of tax, I'm afraid, you know, that that is what uh, the politics is going to be all about. OK, thank you. And with that, I'm going to go to Julie, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thanks for everyone for, for being here. It's a pleasure to ask the questions. Um, my questions focus on the role of government and government intervention uh, to support jobs and businesses. And I'd just like to start with Lord Darling, if I may. Um, you, you mentioned it in your opening remarks uh, to the Chair, um, the labour market and how the government might support um, jobs going forward. Do you think the, the government should be looking at um, very active intervention in the, the, the jobs market, such as funding training, um, uh, public employment schemes, particularly for young people? Um, and, and actually, is the government and the Treasury actually any good at running schemes like that? Well, the, the short answer is uh, yes, it does need to look at a whole range of things. And this is an example of where, you know, really only the government is big enough to provide the scale of uh, support that I think will be necessary. And we, as I said earlier, we need to get ourselves into the frame of mind where we're thinking about 1980s levels of unemployment. If it doesn't happen, that's great. But I think we need to be ready for that. And if we're not ready for that, people will ask, why didn't you start thinking about these things? Don't wait till the, the problem builds up with all the social as well as the economic problems. Um, firstly, uh, I think it does need, need to look at uh, training and or retraining because without doubt there are, you know, there are people, you know, for example, in the aviation industry, uh, most of them say, look, it's going to take, you know, at least three years before we're back to where we were at the start of all this. So people will need maybe to be retrained to do other things. Equally, in the hospitality industry, it would be astonishing if there aren't casualties there, with, you know, especially the smaller operators and so on. So it needs to do that. But it's not just you know, schemes for people who've lost their jobs. We also need to maintain our support, as I think um, uh, has been said earlier, to make sure that uh, you know, we have the economic fabric that we have at the moment is still there in a couple of years' time. And that, you know, that very act of supporting industries where it's necessary, either through grants, loans, or you know, taking shares in some cases, uh, that, you know, that helps preserve jobs as well. So yet yeah, we do need a whole range, a whole range of uh, things. On, on short answer to your question on is the Treasury good at these things? Well, the, the, the Treasury traditionally hasn't done these things. It's the Department of Work and Pensions and, you know, Department of Education uh, and, and um, other departments. Uh, you know, I think the, the government as a whole can set a structure critically what it can set is the rates of pay. And remember, a lot of people, when they come off these job um, protection schemes, the furlough schemes, if they go on to universal credit, uh, you know, it, it's reckoned that, you know, that, that the income could fall by, you know, nearly, nearly 50%. So you, you, only government can address that sort of structural problem, if you like. Uh, but, um, you know, there's plenty of lessons of what we shouldn't be doing from the 1980s. Uh, you know, so I hope we can we can we can build on that because there are good lessons in the last 
I don't know, 15, 20 years of things that do work and do help people get into work. But you've got to be flexible. And I would say to the Chancellor, don't be afraid of coming back to the House of Commons again and again, uh, changing your mind, adapting. It's far better to do that, but do it in advance. Don't wait as, you know, you're seeing a bit of that just now where things that uh, were said to happen, going to happen didn't actually happen. Okay, thank you. Um, but you, you mentioned the Chancellor's just, he's recently mentioned Project Birch to support um, some structurally important, uh, strategically important uh, businesses. Um, in those and other cases for business, should the government be looking quickly to, to transition from loan support to equity support? Well, I, I think that whether you make a loan, whether you make a grant, or if you, you know, if you take equity, it really depends on the circumstances. I mean, clearly in a small or medium-sized business, you wouldn't be taking equity there. Uh, you might be looking at grants or loans. Um, uh, but whereas if you were dealing with you know, a, a, an airline or a utility company, uh, I think it's quite reasonable to say, look, um, we'll help you through this, but um, it's, it's only fair the taxpayer gets rewarded for having taken uh, part of that burden. Uh, so I, I think it, there should be a range of options. Uh, and let me say before you know you follow up on this, it is going to be difficult because you know government doesn't have a great record in picking uh, winners and so on. But I think we just have to be pragmatic about it. The key to my mind is that we, if we can preserve jobs and preserve, you know, the, the, if you like, the economic uh, fabric of our country, then we should do everything we possibly can. If that's not possible, then let's look at a range of possibilities that critically, you know, can get people back, you know, ready to go back into work as soon as the jobs are there for them. Uh, but, you know, bear in mind that all depends on getting your economy growing, whether there are jobs to get people into. Yeah, just following up on something you said, you mentioned picking winners. Um, how, how do we, can we do that? Um, how do we decide which businesses should be saved and, and how we get value for money for, for the, the, the efforts we make to do that? Let, let give an example of where, it, to, to my mind, it would be, you know, there'd be no choice of having to do something. If one of the, uti the, the, the people who provide our utilities, water um, or electricity, if one of them was going bust, we'd have to do something about it uh, because you can't leave, you know, citizens without those basic services. Um, but, you know, if, if you take the, the aviation industry, um, you'll notice that France and Germany are not indifferent to whether or not their airline, you know, the national airline is surviving. Now, you know, we, 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 you know, our model here is slightly different um, in, in, in that, uh, you know, the idea of a flag carrier isn't quite what it was. Uh, but, you know, I think most people would take the view that we've got to maintain, make sure that we've got a transport industry. The railway companies, you know, case in point where, you know, frankly, you know, uh, the, the days of, um, you know, the privatization are long behind us. And I think people recognize the state's going to end up doing that, uh, whatever happens. But, you know, it, when it comes to individual companies, it, it I, I don't, you know, I don't think you could have, you know, a, a set of rules that would probably accommodate everything. You just have to use your common sense. Let me give you an example of, you know, nearly 50 years ago now, um, it was highly controversial when the then Conservative government nationalised Rolls-Royce because it ran out of money to develop its RB211 engine. And people said, well, they made a silly mistake. Actually, that engine proved to be highly successful. Rolls-Royce is a very, very successful company. So it's that sort of judgment you have to bring to bear. But I freely admit, um, you know, that uh, if you do all these things, there's bound to be cases where people can quite rightly say, well, you know, that was never going to go in the first place. But that's usually, but not always, but usually with the benefit of hindsight. Thank you very much. Could I um, turn to Philip Hammond, please, um, and just ask you about um, decision making again about about the where the funds go, bailout funds go. Should the government be looking to introduce green criteria in that decision making? We mentioned the aviation sector potentially as a as an area where that consideration might come into play. Well, the government's got um, long term strategic objectives, and one of them is uh, to deliver a, a zero carbon economy by 2050. Um, so unless the government changes that strategic objective, and I don't expect for a moment that it would, um, then obviously uh, every initiative that it takes needs to sit within uh, the set of strategic uh, objectives that the government has already set out. What I think Alistair was sort of hinting uh, at, and I would certainly reinforce, is that um, we will get in quite a mess if we start taking equity stakes in businesses or giving loans to businesses on the basis that the government then starts uh, 
uh, interfering, micromanaging in the day-to-day -day management of those businesses and the decisions um, that they take. Um, it's, it's never a good idea. And frankly, government doesn't have the capacity um, to do it well. So I think as we go into this next phase, I mean, obviously, um, the, 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 there's some quite interesting um, contradictions here. Um, Alistair talked about preserving jobs. I think what we, what we all would want to focus on is um, maximizing employment in the economy. That doesn't necessarily mean preserving old jobs that maybe have been made fundamentally non-viable, but it does mean that where people lose jobs, we need to get them as quickly as possible into new jobs. And that needs two things. It needs growth in the economy and investment, and it needs facilitation of retraining. And your, your original question was around whether the government should do more in the area of retraining. And unequivocally, yes. Um, we're looking at a world where skills are, uh, are changing very rapidly. Uh, and the least thing that the government could and should do is ensure that as unemployment starts to rise, as it surely will, um, we step up the efforts that we're making to help people get back uh, into uh, employment by having um, the right skills. And there's always a tension between the desire to protect employment. So there'll be a, there'll be a tremendous political pressure in this recovery to not let um, people become unemployed, to not let companies fail. And we have to balance that against, I think, what we know from previous um, downturns, that the best economic outcome is to get the restructuring that is necessary done quickly, not, not try to um, protect um, failed businesses, but to facilitate um, the people who work in them to move on and have um, uh, good employment prospects um, for the future. And getting that balance right between the desire to get through the transformation and move on, and the desire on the other hand to protect jobs in order to maintain um, un, uh, to maintain employment as high as we can is going to be a, a politically difficult one to navigate. Do you think um, when we're looking at investing in businesses and restructuring for, for uh, employment, um, do you think we should use existing structures such as the British Business Bank, UK Investments, or should we look to uh, establishing something completely different and an investment bank specifically for that purpose? Um, I think it depends on the scale of the challenge and it's too early um, to say yet. I think we have we have got some good structures in place um, that were put in place um, at the time of or since the last uh, crisis. I think they do have capacity, um, but but we don't know the scale of the challenge that will be facing us. I mean, um, if if the requirement is very widespread across huge swathes of industry uh, for recapitalization of, of businesses, of companies, and the markets are not in a position uh, to do that. And actually, there's, there's no sign yet that the markets won't be uh, in a position to do that. Markets, are, as George said earlier, are, are, are very active. Um, but if that were to become the case, then we might have to look at other structures, but I think we've got quite a good set of structures in place at the moment. The bit that we're missing, and, and this alludes to something that was said earlier, but the bit that we're missing um, is uh, at the retail end of the business market. So how do you get loans to small businesses? And um, we, we had this challenge at the time of the financial crisis. We've had it again now that the Bank of England can do things to um, make uh, money cheaper uh, and it can push money into the system, but only the commercial banks have the infrastructure to act as a delivery mechanism to, to, to transmit that monetary stimulus down to the level of small businesses. And frankly, I think quite a, quite a number of the banks are quite uncomfortable with the role that they're currently being cast in, um, being essentially pushed to making loans to a set of customers that um, perhaps they're not particularly well equipped um, to deal with, knowing that quite a large proportion of those loans are likely to go bad. Um, 
with a set of rules around the loans. I'm talking about bounce back loans at the moment, a set of rules around those loans that will require the banks to pursue those customers. So if you're a high street bank, I, I think you probably have a bit of a sense of a grievance in some cases that you are being encouraged or strong armed into making loans to people that you strongly suspect won't be able to repay them, knowing that you're then going to be able, you're going to be told that you've got to pursue them, your customers, um, to repay loans that they can't repay. It's an uncomfortable situation. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. And could I turn to George Osborne, please? Thank you. Um, you mentioned you, you'll be, I'm sure, very. Um, it's very obvious that you had lots of questions about bankers bonuses a few years ago. Um, what's your view on the conditionality that we should put on investing in businesses? The government. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm a bit skeptical about conditionality. Um, there's a, the reason we're lending money to these businesses is that we have taken a deliberate choice to shut down our economy to tackle a pandemic. In previous periods of British history, we would have allowed the pandemic to rage through our society because we wouldn't have been rich enough to shut down the economy and we wouldn't, people would have starved if they stayed at home, even if they were ill. And uh, that's what happened in cholera epidemics and the you know, plagues and so on. Thankfully, we've moved on from that, but we've taken a deliberate, you in parliament have deliberately passed laws that say people can't gather, businesses can't open and so on. Um, and so the money that we're providing is a rescue. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, it's the consequence of public policy. You know, we're not, it's not part of an industrial strategy. If, if we want an industrial strategy, then come up with an industrial strategy. But that's not what this is. These are emergency finance to companies, whether they be the largest in the country or the smallest, to uh, essentially compensate them while we put or keep them alive while we take the whole economy into coma, if you like, induced coma. Um, and so once you start saying, well, this company has to be green or this company director shouldn't get a bonus, or you're into industrial policy. And uh, even I would say, and this is more controversial, even if you're saying we've got to make sure we make money on this investment. And I remember when I was shadow chancellor, there was a lot of talk of like, we're going to, this investment in RBS is the best thing that's ever come our way. You know, and here we are 10 years later, still owning the thing and way below the share price that, um, you know, that we get our money back. So, you know, and I always took the view and I took this view when I sold an RBS stake as a chance that, you know, the, my predecessor had bought RBS shares, not because he was trying to make a fast buck, because he was trying to save the bank and save the British economy. And, and, and we're doing the same. So I would not attach a lot of conditionality. I wouldn't get too hung up about making a profit. You know, that's not what this is about, and we shouldn't confuse the two um, objectives. Thank you. Do you think um, that this pandemic and the government's response to it, do you think it's changed people's perception of the role of the state um, in general terms? Uh, yeah, well, I think it's reminded people that the state, that we, the, the reason why we have very large states uh, is not provide us all with physical security, which was the sort of original concept of the state, but to provide us with economic security as well, that it can step in there and, and provide for us at you know, times of great need, whether driven by the economic cycle or a pandemic or whatever. Um, and and you know, it's reminded us essentially of the awesome power of government, that the British government, because of its credibility, um, because of its institutions, which you are part of, uh, can go out there and get the whole of the world effectively to lend its money in very large amounts of money at this point. So, you know, I think, yes, it has, you know, I think it's been a reminder of that. I think one thing that will change, um, and we could maybe come on to all sort of other things that are going to change about the role of technology and whether we're happy with government being more intrusive into who we are and where we are and who we meet as part of, you know, pandemic control. But I think tax you know, is one thing which I wrestle with and, you know, I'm not, I'm not claiming for a moment I got it right. Um, and and my, both my successor and predecessor also wrestle with, you know, I think there will be a sense that if you want the protection of the state, you need to pay your tax, either as an individual or as a company. And, you know, I, I wrestled with trying to get the big international uh, companies to pay more tax and we had OECD agreements and so on 
Um, I know, you know, for example, Philip tried to get uh, self-employed people to pay more tax. I increased the tax on dividends for people who paid themselves through dividends. But the basic argument was, if you want the protection of the state, whether it's the economic protection, or by the way, the physical protection to stop your property being stolen or your company being stolen, you have to pay for it. And, and I, you know, I think that is something where left and right can agree on uh, as we come out of this uh, pandemic. It's just been a reminder of why we pay our taxes. Okay, thank you. My time's up. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Julie. And going over now to Javon, please. Hi, thanks. I'd like to look at capital expenditure um, and at changing priorities. In recent weeks, societal norms have turned on their head with long-lasting changes in how we work, travel and learn. As society has changed, has the priority of infrastructure projects also changed? And given the historically low interest rates, what scope do the former chancellors think there is for capital investment or increased capital investment after the crisis? Uh, who would you like to go to, Siobhan? Oh, Alistair. Oh. Alistair, thank you. Yeah. Um, but yes, I, I do think um, of all the many things that the government needs to be looking at is um, uh, if it's going to spend money, it's got to spend money on improving our infrastructure because that will bring a long term benefit. Um, I'd make a, no, a general point that I think it would be far better for the government to be looking at stuff that is relatively near shovel ready and can be delivered relatively quickly. Um, as many of you will know, I have been a long standing critic of HS2 uh, because, you know, I think by the time it's finished, um, it will be even more out of date than, you know, than I think it is now. And you'd be far better spending the money on projects that you can actually get going and deliver. Uh, you know, I'm not against big transport projects. You know, they are important. And going to a point which um, George Osborne will, uh, will no doubt uh, agree with me, if, if we generally want to see the transfer of power to the regions, the Northern Powerhouse is one example of where we can do it. And, uh, you know, you, there's lots of smaller transport projects that will bring greater immediate benefit uh, than some of these mega projects. So there's an example of, of where I think the government can do things and do it quickly uh, because you know you want something that can deliver benefit within a relatively short period of time. Then there's you know there's other things like you know broadband for example, you know where we've done an awful lot, but you know uh, you know we, we we're still not as good as we need to be. Nowhere near it. And some parts of the country, uh, you know, the connections are not great at all. So you know there's there's two examples. I think one of the other things, you know, there's been a lot of talk of devolving power um, to the regions. Uh, I think it's important that we in, in involve, you've mentioned the Northern Powerhouse, but other parts of England and particularly outside the southeast, where, you know, that they should be allowed to and able to contribute to the decisions as to where money could usefully be spent that would add to the greater good in, uh, in, in, in that particular region. So I, I think both those things would uh, uh, be useful. But, you know, your general point about um, spending on infrastructure, uh, yes, uh, uh, directly and indirectly, I think it is a very important thing for the government to be doing. Um, do George or um, Philip have any different point of view? Well, maybe I'll just stick up for HS2, although um, it was launched when Alistair was Chancellor of the Exchequer, I will point out. Uh, the, You're allowed you to know, change the, your mind. <laughs> yes. Um, but the... Um, I think it's a very good example. You know, when I when so when I became chancellor in 2010, I gave the go-ahead, the final go-ahead to Crossrail, and Crossrail had been announced by Cecil Parkinson in the Conservative Party conference in sort of 1988, and and it's still not open. Uh, and these project, these big projects, transformative projects, take an unbelievably long period of time to get going, to get planning for, to pass through Parliament, to get and then to be constructed. In fact, often the construction is relatively rapid once it's um, got all those approvals. Um, you know, look at the endless debate about the Heathrow runway, which Parliament has supported. And so, you know, I, these, you know, if you say cancel HS2 and and build like a, you know an east-west line across the Pennines, which I, you know I'm very supportive of as chair of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, and and you know was but it's not going to HS2 is now fine after 12 years beginning to be constructed and I think will make big transformation to the economic geography of north and south but set that aside it's just a it's just an illusion to think you can drop one massive project it's taken 12 yeah. years to get to this point 
and pick up some new project that you're going to build a railway line from Manchester to Leeds tomorrow. It's just not going to happen. And, and so, you know, I think this, there are many things the government can throw into capital spending on almost a kind of turning up the dial basis. You know, that's why chancellors always announce pothole funds. Uh, you know, you can, you can put more money into local authority transport budgets um, and the like. But, but the kind of really, I think, significant economic change that the big infrastructure can bring about, like our motorways and railways before us, um, is stuff that takes a long time in our country because we protect property rights and we have a democracy. Um, I mean, one obvious final observation I make, which you know, this call is a demonstration of, I mean, you know, we have been reminded of the enormous importance of digital infrastructure. And again, all governments have str struggled with broadband rollout, getting broadband to remoter areas, even to pockets of, of, of you know, dense cities. And, you know, I, I think coming back to that, and, and I've never never really seen anything that worked as well as it should have, and I knocked my head against the wall, and, and I'm not saying I came up with the answer, but I, I, I do think it's a kind of self-evident that one thing at the end of all of this is we're going to be a more digitally connected society, and by the way, in many ways, it's more efficient. Maybe you'll even be able to vote online one day. <laughs> uh, yeah. Philip, do you have anything you want to add or...? Yeah, can I just first of all add my voice to the support for HS2? I think it will be truly transformative. I know people are skeptical about it now, but the test will be in 20 years' time. And I'll bet that people all over the country are saying we could not live without this piece of infrastructure. But it's self evidently true that if working patterns, commuting patterns change significantly, and, and we don't yet know the extent to which digital working, working from home, uh, different patterns of commuting will persist. I think we're probably, you know, six months, nine months, a year away from understanding how much of this will change back to how it was before and how much will stick. But once we can see that, then obviously the infrastructure project priorities should change to reflect those changes. But I just want to add one other point, which is that um, uh, people often talk, people in Parliament often <laughs> talk as if um, the only issue around how much infrastructure we have is how much money the Chancellor decides to pour in the top of the hopper. Actually, the constraints, as George just described some of them, are much more in the real economy than they are around the amount of finance available. Um, I, we've seen periods in our modern history when investments have been announced in uh, the rail sector, for example, and then it's become clear to government that all we're doing is fueling inflation in that sector because there's a limited amount of capacity, for example, to deliver rail electrification. Um, and, and across the piece, whether we're looking at um, uh, construction or uh, um, network infrastructure like railways, um, if we want to st a step change in the amount of infrastructure we can deliver, we will first need a step change in the capacity of our infrastructure delivery industries. So we, we don't have big construction companies in this country in the way that our continental neighbors and the Asians do. Um, uh, and, we need, and we don't have um, enough domestic skills around infrastructure delivery. BT, for example, will tell you happily that if somebody wants to pour money into the system, they can roll broadband out more quickly but only if they're allowed to import somewhere between 15 and 30,000 foreign engineers um, to do the work. Thank you all. Now, a bit of special pleading. You've all mentioned digital connection. Uh, the whole crisis has thrown up how unequal our society is for some, and particularly for children, and children who cannot learn at home because they don't have digital connection. So I wondered, would the Chancellor support my bill calling on the government to ensure that all children entitled to free school meals have internet access at home? One word from each of the three of you. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll step in. I, I do think, you know, this, this crisis has thrown up, a, you know, a real apartheid in our country between the people who have, you know, online schooling, access to a laptop, access to internet, and people who maybe there's no internet access or there's one computer in the household and they're expected to do their lessons whilst, 
you know, their parents are watching and all their children are supposed to be at school in the, you know, it, it has really highlighted, I think, a sharp educational divide that perhaps wasn't as so as apparent. So, you know, whether they, I don't know about the details of your bill, but, I, yes do, or no? but I, I like the idea of it, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I take that as a yes. Alistair, I'm looking for your support now. Uh, so I was, I was trying to find the unmute button that shows uh, <laughs> how, how skillful I am. Yeah, I mean, the points that, that you've made and George made are absolutely right. That one of the many tragedies of uh, this year is there's an awful lot of uh, children, especially, who are going to be severely disadvantaged when eventually they get back to school. And it's not just the availability of the equipment, of course, it's the, it's the ability of someone in the house to be able to guide them through it. And they're also, for good good measure, just my, my own experience of talking to people, you know, in, in, where I am just now, uh, that uh, there's a huge variation between what schools are doing. Some are very active, some are less so. But the idea of making sure that everybody gets the same advantages, uh, you know, it, it must be right. Thank you. Philip, yes or no? Well, I, Alistair's the only one of us that's going to get to vote on this bill, of course. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's in it, but uh, I, I, like George said, um, in principle, it must be right that if we're going to move to a world where more things are done online, things that are not discretionary, I'm not talking about entertainment here, but talking about basic education being moved online, then of course we've got to ensure that all children that are in that compulsory education system have the equipment necessary to, um, to access that. Uh, online education. If that means that we have to operate, um, you know, school loan schemes where children take laptops home, then I, I'm, I'm sure that's a sensible idea. Um, and, and finally, um, sorry, from me, uh, the other big divide that this whole thing has thrown up for me as a London uh, MP is the housing crisis. Mm. We see so many people sharing homes, kitchens, bathrooms, no outside space. Um, given that every pound invested in housing results in 284 spent in the rest of the economy, would the former chancellors agree with me that now is the time for the government to support an expanded social housing programme? And does uh, Mr Osborne look back with regret at his decision to cut the housing budget by 50% and to move away from socially rented housing? Well, actually, we, we got house building going again, and I, we, we, we invested a lot in shared equity schemes uh, as well. I mean, I, look, I, can I, we come back to similar to the infrastructure point, which is the problem in London, you know, and I edit a newspaper here in London, and in many other parts of the country, I was a Cheshire MP for, you know, almost two decades. It's, it's getting people to accept that you have to free up space for houses to be built on, and sometimes they have to be green fields. And, you know, we can all kid ourselves that but it's But that's all... my other campaign, George. I was trying to convince the <laughs> government to build on, yeah, on the green, on green, green belt. Well, you know, we can convince money. ourselves. We, the number of times, I mean, we're going to talk about brownfield sites and, you know, and it's the truth is we, if we want to have larger homes, more homes for people, I'm afraid we have to take more land. And, uh, you know, I used to have this argument, and I can say this now, <laughs> I'm no longer seeking re-election in Tatton. You know, it was well, well, probably well, the green belt seat. Lot, you know, it was the, probably the single biggest issue other than aircraft noise that was raised with me as an MP. People objecting to planning permissions, objecting to new homes. When the new homes were built, there were no other, you never heard another complaint about it. Uh, just indeed when the new runway was opened in Manchester, you didn't hear so much again about aircraft noise. So, you know, it, it's it's the objections that we all, you know, and, and the temptation on an elected official is to go along with the, you know, the, the, the village conservation group, the town conservation group here in London, the, you know, people say we can't have higher buildings or whatever. And, you know, fine, but the consequence of that is that you are denying housing uh, to other people. Um, any other quick responses? I just well, I was, the, um, depending on where we go in the recovery from COVID, whether um, people are still happy to live in cities, whether cities are still attractive places for people to live, because uh, if we don't find a vaccine or a treatment for the disease, people may um, recalibrate their views about where they want to live and how they want to live. I think we are going to have to 
uh, consider quite fundamentally how the housing market works. And that, again, as George said, comes back to um, the planning system. I think the immediate problem, um, speaking to you as a, as a Londoner, the immediate problem is um, what happens to the demand for market housing in London in the aftermath of this crisis, because of course, it is largely the building of market housing that drives the delivery of social housing in the system um, but it doesn't that we work. have at the moment. Well, we could, have a, we could have a long debate about whether mayors setting unrealistically high levels of affordable housing delivers more or less affordable housing, but perhaps that's a debate for another day. <laughs> Alistair? Yeah, Siobhan, just to get this away from London, since I yeah. have... Oh, no! <laughs> uh, is, this is a problem, the lack of um, affordable housing is a problem in just about every town and city at the length and breadth of the United Kingdom. The planning issues are a problem equally, you know, throughout the country, they're not, not that different. Uh, but I agree with you uh, that um, we're never going to solve the housing problem unless, you know, that, that, that we, frankly, we reform the planning system uh, so there is more land to build on. But, you know, the government will, is certainly on, on affordable housing. The government, the government has to assist there. Uh, but, you know, it, it is a problem just about everywhere. And just as an aside, it will be interesting to see what happens in a city like Edinburgh to the Airbnb market now, because... As far as I can see, people are rushing to get out of it. Will that mean more housing coming on the market for people who live, live here? Well, we'll wait and see. Great. Th thank, thank you, you very you. much. Thank, thank you, Joanne. We need, need to move on now, but thank you. And uh, on to Anthony, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I should say, I think I've got the uh, George Floyd process outside my window here in Parliament. If there's any background noise, I can hear that some uh, trumpets going. Um, I'd like each of you to imagine that you're actually back in uh, number 10 as Chancellor. Uh, and what would you actually do now so we've i think there's consensus that the immediate focus for the next year or two is growth we need a growth plan uh paying off the national debt we can push that uh back a little bit as a focus so what would your growth plan be we have talked about some of the elements we touched on uh short-term fiscal cuts maybe that uh you mentioned retraining broadband uh some other infrastructure investments but are there can you expand on some of that? Or are there other elements as well, like deregulation, where there's been chatter in the media about the Sunday trading laws? Uh, we've just been talking about the planning system. Uh, the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's question time today focused on green growth. There's a lot of talk about that, you know, how much substance is there uh, to that. So if you if you were um, in the in the Chancellor again now, what would your growth plan be for the next year or two? And I'm going to do it in chronological order as Chancellor. So start with uh, Alistair Darling. Well, we... We've talked about a lot of the things this afternoon. I, I, I don't want to repeat them, but you know, uh, obviously, if, if any if any one of us was back in num at number eleven, one of the things we'd be working on now is you know a, a statement, call it what, a financial statement, uh, in you know next month probably, or or um, certainly no later than that, uh, looking at measures to get the economy going. A lot, of course, depending on what is actually happening on the health front, to fit in with that. Um, on deregulation. Um, I, I'm a bit difficult here. I would have no problem with the Sunday trading reform since I live in a part of the United Kingdom where we've never had, not, not actually in, for most of my life, we ever had restrictions. And it, it was always, you know, a source of frustration to me if I would travel down in London to discover I couldn't go to a supermarket to get something to eat because it's had the wrong square footage. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I, I don't have any problem with that, but, you know, I accept that in parts of England that's more controversial. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how much more deregulation that would actually create the sort of jobs that, that, that you're talking about. The key thing to me, as I said earlier, is short-term economic stim uh, stimulus measures we've talked about. But critically, I would want to be getting um, the whole of government involved in measures to help people uh, uh, you know, as they either stay in work or when they, if they, if they lose their jobs, uh, to be able to get retrained as appropriate and to get people into work. And, you know, we've been talking about infrastructure schemes, and I, I don't want to repeat what I've said. Just, uh, you know, I think that's fairly straightforward. What I would say, though, is it needs to, you know, the government needs to be planning, as I said earlier, it needs to be planning and just assuming that, let's just assume that things are going to be uh, worse so that we're, if it's better, that good and well. But don't leave it till it's too late because it does take a long time to put these things in place. Thank you. Um, George, what would your economic recovery plan be? Well, uh, beyond what we've already been talking about, well, on the, on the maximum, you shouldn't waste a good crisis. Um, first of all, scrap the ridiculous Sunday trading laws. I tried as Chancellor. It was one of the defeats I suffered at the hands mainly of uh, the combination of Labour members who were backing Usdor 
motion, shop workers motion. I'm not sure they've done much to save uh, shop workers jobs as a result. And Conservative MPs who didn't want to have neither. And, uh, you know, it struck me as completely bizarre when you're trying to save the high street and every MP that I've come across wants to protect their local high street, that you wanted it shut for one of the days of the week when most people might have a chance of going shopping. Um, and, and, you know, but anyway, I lost that campaign, so I might be tempted to go back into battle on that one. Um, planning, we did actually make some important changes to planning laws in 2010, 11, 12. Uh, Nick Bowles was the minister involved. And, uh, you know, actually, um, you got through past, frankly, here, Conservative MPs, changes to planning, you know, in areas like South Cambridgeshire, dare I say, that they would not otherwise contemplate uh, because the local population accepts that there has to be some sort of stimulus. Um, I think on the, uh, on sort of, there's a more kind of complicated thing around labour market flexibility, because what, you know, really saved Britain over the last 30 years since the 1980s was actually the labour market flexibility that was that was brought in there uh, and you know enabled jobs to go to where they were, people to go to where the jobs were uh, you know I, I would you know remove impediments to that and then I would really you know and, but I'm talking my book here what, you know, what, I would double, what sort of double, impediments do you mean well, things like being able to get, to Siobhan's point, actually, being, you know, tenure on council tax homes, you know, council, uh, council homes, you know, social housing. It's, you know, it's incredibly difficult to move to a new job and get social housing, not just because of the lack of um, supply, but also because of the lack of new building, but actually over very complicated issues around tenure, which, you know, don't play on other parts of the economy. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I would, you know, triple down, if that's a word, on, and here I'm talking about book, on the Northern Powerhouse. And the Northern Powerhouse, and by the way, the Midlands as well, I'm not just, it's not just a slogan, although it's probably the, the one slogan that's endured longer than any, almost any other, although we're all in it together, it seems to have come back. Uh, the, the Northern Powerhouse, you know, is not just, it's about, it's a proper serious economic theory that if you bring the cities of the North closer together, connect them to their towns, you create a single economic area, that rivals London, you know, Boston Bay Area, Tokyo, and so on. And uh, you do that with the transport connections we've just been talking about by radical devolution to the mayors. We created metro mayors in places like Manchester. It, that should definitely happen. You know, the mayors that don't exist in places like West Yorkshire should be created. Uh, and we should have the confidence to devolve to organizations like Transport for the North, real economic power and decision making. Uh, and, and then give a massive boost to the science and universities and teaching hospitals, which are the jewels in the crown of those great northern cities. And, you know, if you do all that, you know, I think there was always a suspicion. I remember this argument about HS2 that if you built a train line to London, everyone would come to London and it was sort of somehow <laughs> depopulate Manchester. I was, a, you know, MP near Manchester. You know, but if you take a, a different example, if you take Reading and more in the Thames Valley, there's a very fast connection from London to Reading. And Reading, when I was a child, was more of a dormitory town for London and people came in. But now the Thames Valley and Reading is, and that area is full of company headquarters, businesses, and people actually commute into the area. Um, and so, you, can, you know, the, the, those efficient transport links, coupled with the devolution, coupled with a big, big uh, kick up the, you know, big injection of uh, uh, energy and, and indeed money into sort of science and universities and so on uh, would be great. Um, final point, I wouldn't go, wouldn't have gone ahead, but this is where I disagree with my party, with scrapping the 2p reduction in corporation tax that I legislated for, uh, because I think at the moment that would be sending a big signal that Britain's open for business around the world. Okay, thank you. Philip, if you were Chancellor, back in number 11 again, what would you, above and beyond what we've been talking about? And if well, you're so, so, um, so George, George has talked about um, Northern Powerhouse. Let me, I agree with what he said on that, but let me put it in a wider context. The UK's fundamental problem is that our productivity is too low. And try as all of us have done and our successors, um, it's remaining stubbornly low. So everything we do has to be in the context of improving productivity. And one of the drivers of our poor productivity is the huge productivity gap between different parts of the country. Um, devolution, I'm sure, will be a big part of resolving that. And I, it's an aside, but I think when this crisis is over and the analysis is done of how the UK has performed 
during the crisis with a very centralized system of government compared to how some other countries um, have responded. I think that might, might because I don't know what the um, result of that analysis will be, but that might prove to be a big impetus towards the movement for devolution to our major cities and uh, economic um, areas. So keep the focus relentlessly on driving productivity because although it's a, a techie sounding word, what productivity uh, actually means is people's living standards. Higher productivity equals higher living standards for all working uh, people. Um, we should facilitate uh, that and uh, facilitate the, the, the transition of employment from businesses that have failed during this um, recession or businesses that have had their demise accelerated, for example, in, in the retail sector. Uh, we should invest in uh, training and employment uh, support, um, employment markets to help people move into um, future employment. And then as chancellor, I would um, want to provide necessary fiscal support to demand in the economy, but I would do that little and often. I think it's very difficult to see at this stage what the balance of supply and demand is going to be as the economy recovers. And I would advise the chancellor to be prepared to make regular statements and regular adjustments to his position if it's clear that uh, demand is inadequate to support the recovering supply side of the economy. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Can I just ask one last question to uh, George? And it's a slight change of subject, but I think people will be interested to know just on China, uh, that clearly you are one of the big champions of um, the new golden era of uh, trade between the UK and China. Uh, but circumstances have changed, not just coronavirus, but the clampdown on uh, Hong Kong. And uh, there's a new sort of awareness amongst the government that we have to have a slightly more sort of uh, sceptical approach uh, towards China, as well as concern on uh, Hong Kong. I was just wondering what your what your stance on China now would be. Has your opinion changed on it? Well, I, I don't think it's changed, but I, but it may have been misrepresented. You know, I'm not remotely naive about China. Uh, you know, they are an authoritarian system. They you know suppress human rights. Uh, they cause you know they've caused trouble with the security law in Hong Kong. Um, but what is also true is that China is the longest continuously existing civilization in the world. It's a sixth of the world's population. It's going to be the world's largest economy if it not already is. And it's going to be one of the great superpowers. And, uh, and, and the, so the central question for the West uh, and is how do you handle the rising power? It's a classic, you know, the so-called Thucydides trap. How do you handle China. and issuing a kind of press release you know is not an answer um and just sort of complaining about china is not really a solution i'm not sure you know you're then faced with a, the question what do you do do you either try and contain china sort of like we, we did with the soviet union well first of all china is vastly more connected into the global economy than the Soviet Union and doesn't pose the kind of immediate military threat that the Soviets did. Um, but I, I don't think the West has anything like the appetite to engage in a serious containment policy of China. For a start, you know, Trump tore up the TPP the moment he came into office, and I don't want to mention the B word, but Britain left the, you know, Central European alliance that was crucial to the it's crucial with NATO to defeating the Cold War, the EU. So if you're sitting in Beijing, the like the West is doing much of a containment job. And so therefore, you have to work on a co-option strategy of bringing China into the global institutions and making them so-called responsible global citizen, but doing it in a way where, you know, when they don't behave like that, there is a clear consequence. And I have to say, the thing I completely support that this government has done is the offer to the Hong Kong Chinese citizens. I think that uh, the British nationals, uh, you know, I think it was a missed opportunity by the Conservative government in the 1990s in the first place. And I can't think of many things that would do more for our economic recovery than have a, a load of highly skilled, very diligent, very committed Hong Kong Chinese people come and help us grow our economy again. That's definitely true. Thank, thank you all very much. My time has run out. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, going to Russian R now, please. Roshanara, do you have your sound on? Ah, yeah, you're muted. Aren't you? Hi. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you all in this committee. I wanted to start off with uh, a question about your own individual legacies. 
uh, and an opportunity for you to set us all straight about your own legacies. Do you, each of you feel you did enough to invest in our healthcare system and primary care and social care on your watch in order to have prepared us and made our system, healthcare system and care system resilient enough to cope with this crisis? And I, I think I'm gonna go in order, starting with Alistair, uh, followed by George, followed by uh, Philip. Well, you know, I'm hesitant about writing my own obituary. I'll let other people do that. Um, or alternatively, you could buy my book, which is still on sale from all good booksellers, if you'd like to do that. Um, on the health service, um, you know, I, I, I just make this point. I think, you know, successive governments have spent a lot of money on the health service. We spent a lot of money on it. We increased taxation specifically to do it. Gordon Brown did that at the beginning of this century. Um, what, what I would say is that all of us in one way or another have always put off the day when we know full well that because of demographic change, the bill for the NHS is going to go up and it's going to go up again. We've, we've, none of us have solved the care problem, which of course is an adjunct uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to the health service. And I think after this, uh, people will say never again we're going to get a situation where it becomes so obvious that the thing is being funded just in time. There's got to be resilience. We can't have a situation where there isn't protection equipment. Uh, where we can't do testing. Look, at, we wouldn't be having this discussion if we were sitting in Korea or maybe Germany at this stage. We just say we're just better prepared. And, you know, it's a point I think George made earlier on that perhaps people will realise there are some things that governments can do that we as individuals can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, so rather, I think, than go back over who did what and who might have done more, you know, over the last, what, 20, 30 years or so, I think we should look and ask ourselves where we are just now. And I'm sorry to add to the bill that we have been mounting up this afternoon, that the health service is another area where the government is going to have to spend some money. Yeah. And, and so, staff as well, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. George, um, the, in a, in the health committee warned uh, witnesses in, in 2011 that the Lansbury reform was going to be a big diversion uh, in terms of preparedness for when a pandemic strikes. Uh, Professor Pickles uh, ref was documented recently in her prescient warnings and about £800 million has been taken out of uh, support to local authorities in dealing with health care in recent years. Uh, do you think that that was a mistake with the benefit of hindsight Hindsight in terms of the, the recent years on your watch and your successor's watch? Who's that for? Sorry, George, that was for you, I think. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, well, look, I, I think if you look at, you know, obviously we're right, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Um, you know, I think our NHS, you know, has has not been overwhelmed. I mean, the, the central fear we had in March was that Britain would face a situation that was faced in Northern Italy, where people would present to uh, the hospital, want an intensive care bed or a ventilator and not get it because the NHS couldn't cope. There weren't enough beds um, or ventilators. That was the big, big central fear. That big fear has not happened. And sometimes in politics, you have to sort of spot the absence of war. The the argument we're not having, the fact we're talking, and I'm going to come on to care homes, the fact we're not talking about the NHS being overwhelmed, I think is, you know, a, a, an enormous credit to the people who run the NHS. Absolutely. I think if you're looking, I think if you're, and by the way, all the pandemic planning that I saw, which was, you know, pandemic planning for a flu rather than a coronavirus, and maybe there was an error there that the world made, but the, um, assumed you could you could rapidly ramp up NHS capacity and those Nightingale hospitals was an example of that you could do that and you can do that. Um, I think where Britain has fallen down compared to some other countries like Germany, uh, you know, we have to look at, you know, obviously there'll be questions about the government and how quickly it went into the lockdown and so on. But I think we actually have to look at the structure of our NHS. I think it is a very, very centralised uh, bureaucracy. You know, other countries have a much more regional approach to it. Um, thinking, with this, well, me, my, my question was about whether, on your watch, each of you, could you have done yeah. more to build resilience in our NHS and care system? Because I think, right. as, as Alistair and others, you've already mentioned, we need to look at what we do going forward and what we can right. learn and what our, our current Treasury right. can do, building well, on what your achievements have been. Well, as I think the NHS is too needs to be improved. Yeah, well, the NHS is too centralised. I think when we do the inquiries into what happened on testing and PPE, 
you know, it will not be just because some health minister didn't put a call into some company in China to get some PPE. It's because, you know, we were too slow in the procurement, too centralized. Uh, and I think we should take a leaf out of what ha has happened in Manchester, where it's the one part of England where the NHS is devolved. And, and it, you know, all the agencies I came across in government, it is the most centralized, and by the way, the most difficult to penetrate for the elected government of the day. Uh, so that's just, and then on care homes, look, you know, none of us solved the care home crisis for a very simple reason. There are two ways to pay for better care in our country. You can either take the assets that people have, i.e. their home, get them to sell their home and pay for care. That is very politically painful to do. And the, gonna, uh, to, gonna, or gonna, you, or you, let me finish. Or, or you can increase general taxation and provide a national care service, which would be very expensive to do, maybe the right solution. But then you go and make your argument for another couple of pence on income tax Absolutely. to pay for it. And those are the two options. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on to Philip because I've got a couple of more questions and Chair's going to shut me down soon. So the, pro the problem about resilience is it's it's easy to say after an event, we should have had more resilience against this event. We're all talking about ventilators. Did we have enough ventilators? But if it had been a different type of virus, it wouldn't have been ventilators we needed. It would have been something else. Yes. So um, it's not just about budgets. It's about the way in which you manage resilience. We have a national risk register, which lists literally hundreds of um, risks that the country is facing and is regularly reviewed to try to ensure that we have a proper approach to resilience but there is a balance um, we would equally be mocked and governments regularly are mocked um, when they stockpile large amount of stuff which never gets used gets to the end of its life and has to be destroyed so we clearly didn't get it right in relation to um, resilience around ppe and ventilators um, but it, hindsight is a wonderful thing and I'm I've no doubt at all that the process in the cabinet office of looking at how we manage resilience will be reviewed afterwards um, I just want to say something about NHS budget we put a very large amount of additional money into the NHS in 2018 and of course there were plenty of people around saying thank you very much but we need much more and um, there is a certain there is a capacity in the NHS and you can expand it but you need to expand it with care, because if you just pour money into the top of a system like the NHS, you risk creating sector specific inflation where you don't get more health care. You just get better, more profitable drug companies. And I don't think that's what we want to do. We want to expand the system carefully and methodically. Some, some would argue it should have been done over the decade, uh, not towards the end after considerable pressure. I just wanted to get on to the point about exit strategy. Others have touched on it. You've all highlighted the fact that uh, the interdependence between health and uh, getting the economy kick-started. Um, what do you think, if building on what you've already said, what else do we need to do? Does our Treasury and other bits of government need to do in terms of organizing itself so that the exit strategy doesn't in effect mean a trade-off uh, here in the UK. And then given the uh, international nature of this pandemic, but also markets, what, what, what can we learn from both the financial crisis and the infrastructure that was set up and the global um, uh, cooperation that existed? Uh, many would argue that's missing at the moment and global leadership is lacking uh, and this pandemic and this crisis needs it more than ever before. Can you reflect on some of those some of those issues and concerns very quickly, uh, uh, please? I've got one more after that. Are you asking me to carry on? Uh, yeah, um, please quickly. Uh, I'm just going to get uh, out. Okay. I mean, look, uh, business needs guidance from the government about how we reactivate the economy. What are the assumptions we have to make? Are we living with COVID? Do we have to rebuild uh, our uh, infrastructure around a two meter separation distance? Is that really sustainable? Is there really a scientific base for two meters? For, for example, redesigning office space around a standard of one meter or one and a half meters would be a radically different proposition from redesigning it around two meters. Now, I don't have access to the scientific advice, so I don't know whether um, we've really tested whether we can make that more user-friendly without 
unacceptably compromising the health position. Uh, Alistair, just on the, picking up on the international side, any reflections on, on that? You're muted. Sorry, you're muted, Alistair, I think. The, the international cooperation that we had in 2009 was absolutely essential uh, to get the global economy working again. And especially for a country like ours, you know, which is a, a trading country, uh, the fact that you had uh, communist China and Republican-led United States and uh, you know, other countries in the G20 all meeting in Washington at, the, you know, at that time, and in London, of course, uh, in 2009, it made a massive difference. Uh, and unfortunately, at the moment, you know, well, as you know, the, the two biggest uh, economies you know, are, are barely speaking to each other at the moment. And the prospect of the G20, which happens to exist, it's not perfect, but it's, it happens to exist, uh, you know, it, it's not able to function at the moment. So, uh, yes, it is important. And equally, if you're dealing with something like a, a pandemic, by very nature, it doesn't stop at political boundaries. Uh, and you know, the, the cooperation we need, you know, if only there had been more cooperation when this thing first started, and perhaps we'd have started our lockdown a lot earlier, we will certainly need to work together to look at, um, at what we might do in the future, because the chances are the next pandemic will be different. Uh, so that, uh, you know, you, you, but the cooperation is absolutely critical. George, you touched on, you've touched on a number of social consequences of uh, earlier on. You mentioned social, social consequences. We see what's happening in the US. We see the inequalities in our own country and the effects on poorer people, frontline workers, black and Asian people, uh, and the differential death rates. In terms of our exit strategy, do you think we should be investing more in those groups who need to be employed so that we don't have these radical imbalances that are exacerbated on top of what they've faced over the last decade? For instance, young people, a million young people are likely to be unemployed. Should there be a, a job guarantee, some sort of intermediate labor market as was introduced in the, during the financial crisis to help young people? Because the risk is civil unrest if we don't make sure we give hope to those who are likely to face unemployment. I'm, so, I'm sorry to in, interject, George. Can you give a very short answer to this? I'm just aware of the number of people still to come in. Thank you. And then we'll move on. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, well, I certainly agree, um, think we should have a very comprehensive job programme. Um, I, I mean, I would just, all I would say is, I think, if, you know, the, in this country and elsewhere, there is going to be an ongoing battle which this crisis has accentuated and not removed between those who want, you know, essentially a more progressive approach with government getting involved and helping people and a big role for the private sector and those who want to kind of close borders and whatever. And this crisis has given both fuel for their causes. Thank you, Angela, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I, I just wanted to ask this one initially to Alistair. Um, demand is going to stagnate if there isn't a global recovery. And in fact, COVID-19 is echoing around the world at different levels and may persist in places and keep coming back. Therefore, it will have a huge uh, effect on global trade. In fact, I think it's the IMF is predicting a minus 3% fall in, in global GDP, which is unheard of in our lifetimes. So what do you think we should be doing? Uh, you began to answer this, but how can we use the international uh, institutions to try to pull a global response together? But on that, I think that's difficult because if America and China aren't there, you know, the two largest economies, you're always gonna make pretty limited um, uh, progress. Um, I, I would look at it in a slightly different way, Angela. That, I think the, the key thing that we need to concentrate on the, at the moment on is what do we need to do to open up our economy? And it seems to me the key for that is to get a testing system that actually works. Now, we're a long way off that just now. Um, the only people being tested are people who report in thinking they might have had uh, uh, COVID. Most of us don't know whether we've had it or not because a lot of us, you know, it, we, the symptoms just aren't there. Uh, but if people in this country had the confidence they could go out and do all the things that we want to be doing, uh, that would be great. But it would also internationally, it would help people say, yeah, the, the UK is OK to go to. I and mean, we've got this debate just now, you know, about quarantining people coming off airplanes, you know, which might have been a great idea three months ago, but I'm not convinced at the moment. Um, but that it's, it, you know, both of us have been in government and you will know that governments are actually, you know, they find it difficult to concentrate on more than two or three big things at one time. Uh, 
And if I, you know, if I was, uh, you know, not number 11, but number 10, I would do it, concentrate on everything I'm doing at the moment to make sure that we do actually have a testing system that, is, that can be up there with the best of them. At the moment, we're not there. But I think if we did, that's where we should be putting our effort in at the moment. Obviously, we can contribute to and continue to call for international cooperation. And, you know, who knows, you know, uh, countries may see eventually that actually we all live on the same planet. We do need to cooperate with each other. Uh, but, you know, I fear that, you know, at the moment, uh, as you know, George was alluding to just now, you know, that um, uh, those who would, you know, take a more protectionist approach are in the ascendancy. And I think... Hey, you're cheering me up. <laughs> I mean, I wonder whether you also think that Germany, countries like Germany did so much better also because they had um, their own quite large manufacturing base. Um, so they could, the, the PPE issue, they can generate and manufacture machines. And our manufacturing sector is too small to respond. So for example, although we manufacture vaccines in the UK, we don't have com uh, companies that we own that we can direct. We don't have a manufacturing base to deal with some of the deglobalization that might be happening as a result of protectionism. Is there something we should be doing to make ourselves more resilient as a country in the build back uh, of that strategic nature? Three quick points. This is an argument that's been going on since the end of the Second World War, when arguably we were very lackadaisical about um, the fact that we needed to rebuild our industries, whereas countries like Germany and Japan obviously had to do it, and they did it very well. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's been happening is that our economy has been predicated on us having access to markets to both import and export to throughout the world, which is why we took a relaxed view about the fact that stuff that we were building here was either uh, we needed here was either being uh, made on the other side of the world or its component parts were there. But that's that's the world in which we live. Um, I think we are going to have to look at some of our resilience and our ability to do things, but I, do, I think you would never get to a situation, actually I'm not sure you'd want to get to a situation where we said, look, we're going to build and make just about everything we need in our country and we're not going to, we're not going to have to go and engage with anybody else because if everybody takes that attitude, the world will be the poorer for it. And as you well know, there's lots of literature on all that. Uh, so I, I don't I, go as advertising autarky. I, I think just a little bit more balance. Yeah, I, I understand the point, the, the point you're making, which is why I said right at the outset, I don't think we should be indifferent to what our economic infrastructure looks like at the end of this. And I do think we should be careful about the fact that you can't always rely on being able to get essential things at times like this. And you know, right. so I, I agree with you that, but I, I just was cautioning against. I'm not. I know you wouldn't do this, but you know. The, people who believe that you know we can shut ourselves off from the rest of the world or our big markets so that's perhaps going into another argument yes um i agree now um george uh, osborne uh, you earlier said don't let don't let's waste a crisis are there opportunities that you think given the amount of um interrelationship now between companies and the treasury of a quite um unexpected uh uh, proportion that the government could do strategically to put us in a better place to face the future. In other words, do we need to um, uh, rebalance and ensure we devolve um, decision making to the regions? Can we um, come up with a concept of inclusive growth that makes us a more robust and resilient country and a fairer country going forwards? Yeah, I think. Um... Look, I, there was a debate uh, before this crisis about the responsibility that companies had beyond that to their, to their sort of bottom line and their shareholders. And it was sort of summarized as ESG, wasn't it? And you know, I think there was a big debate, which, by the way, we need to get back to as a world about the environment. I think the, the sort of S and the G was a bit less kind of well-defined. And if anything, the, the, you know, the t tragic uh, death of George Floyd and all that is a remark reminded people that actually companies also have obligations for, towards inclusion in their communities and and so on. So I think, you know, this will turbocharge all of that that was already in train. Um, and, 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 and when it comes to rebalancing, although I'm not sure there's, you know, so much a sort of private sector, the private sector will follow where the government leads. And I do think, you know, the, and I came to this sort of late when I was in government, you know, in the last couple of years I was chancellor, but the sort of desire to run everything, by the way, particularly in the Treasury, but more broadly in the government, you know, is a mistake. And, you know, you need to, we need to get, understand that what I think 
coming back to the theme, one of the reasons why Germany may have done better is that in all sorts of ways, it's a more regional system, including in its healthcare system. And, you know, we could take a big, you know, bet here on our regions being better at running things, elected mayors, uh, transport authorities, economic decision making, planning control, all those things can be, you know, we could, we could take a really big step forward. Um, and, and by the way, not do the reverse, which is, you know, I see it here in London, you know, we can get into an argument about why transport for London needed to be bailed out and, you know, but, you know, I'm not sure the answer is for the government to start running London transport policy again. And, um, and uh, Philip Hammond, do you think that there's an opportunity uh, in, in not wasting the crisis, which if we don't respond quickly and we're not lucky, might actually, might not be a, a, a recession, it might actually be a depression. Do you think that we ought to try to see if we can um, guide investment so that we make it uh, more environmentally sustainable, for example, so that we help to reach our carbon neutral targets, so that we guide uh, companies to uh, the areas that we want them to try to innovate? I suppose very much like the Mariana Matsukatu approach to things where you can try to get some the right kind of incentives for innovation and build back better, I think, the phrases. Well, firstly, I think investment is already heading in a greener direction for all sorts of reasons. And, and a major one is actually pressure by investors themselves. Companies are finding that the people who are investing in them are increasingly interested in the company's investment strategies to ensure that they align um, with their own. Um, and of course, we should be encouraging investment in innovation but there's a very big gap between creating an environment which is conducive to investment in innovation and the government telling people what they should innovate in. And I'm frankly, I, I'm not at all convinced that UK governments of any color would be very good um, at that. So it's about creating the environment for investment, um, using this crisis to remind ourselves again of the relentless need to focus on productivity improvement, because that is the way to improve living standards, competitiveness, and our economic growth. And as you rightly said at the beginning, um, the UK is probably more vulnerable than any other large economy to the trends in global trade. Uh, and the situation there looks rather depressing at the moment. Uh, there, there were headwinds to global trade as we went into this crisis. I think there are real risks um, that the sort of protectionist instincts that the crisis has aroused are going to lead to even more problems in the very near future. And I think the UK needs to be a flag bearer for the principle of free trade because we've been used for decades to rallying behind the US as the champion of free trade and we can no longer rely on the US to make that argument in international fora. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you. And uh, moving on now to Harriet, please. Thank you, Mel. And I'm going to start by asking uh, Philip a question, as you were the most uh, recent in post, and uh, move on to monetary policy. And um, there are some that are arguing that de facto the Bank of England is engaging in monetary financing at the moment. Do you think that there are any significant uh, concerns about the bank's uh, monetary independence at the moment? Um, I, don't, I, I don't see concerns about um, the independence of the Bank of England. As, as you know, the Bank of England is um, fiercely protective of its, um, uh, of its independence. Um, but it's also, um, and this is a delicate balancing act, um, because fiscal and monetary policy interact as they do, there clearly has to be a sensible level of coordination between chancellors and governors of the Bank of England. I don't think that compromises um, independence, but it's clearly important um, that we don't have monetary and fiscal policy pulling in opposite directions, as, for example, arguably, uh, within the last few years we've seen um, uh, in the US. If we're trying to deal with a problem, we need to be using fiscal and monetary policy tools in a way um, which is complementary. But no, I don't um, have a fear uh, about uh, Bank of England independence. 
And uh, one for Alistair then, please, uh, in terms of the Ways and Means facility, which I know you had to use during uh, the financial crisis. Do you have any um, issues or concerns about the Treasury using the Ways and Means facility this year? Not at the moment, no. Um, you know, I should explain uh, that uh, normally if the government wants to borrow money, it will do it by issuing uh, bonds and it does that through the very efficient debt management office, but you can't do that overnight. You know, you need money short term, you need to get it. And uh, that's what you use your central bank for. Now, as long as you repay it, you know, within a reasonable time, then it's for, it's discharging the function that it was. It's what um, we did, you know, at, at, um, at 10 years ago. Um, where it becomes a problem, you've got a country that simply effectively prints money for you, uh, because in the, you know, in, in the long term that will have a detrimental effect. But I'm, I'm not concerned about it just now. It seems a very sensible thing to do because the government will have to spend, you know, money at short notice, and it obviously needs to get it. And like uh, Philip, I'm not, you know, I'm not concerned about the, the perception of the Bank of England's independence, although I would say that one of the bank's statutory duties is to support the government's economic policy. So, you know, that's been there since we made it independent in 1998. Uh, but using the Ways and Means uh, facility uh, is perfectly sensible as long as you, you know, and both the government and the bank have said they expect this to be temporary. Thank you. And, and, and one for George. Um, we, were, we heard from the Bank of England at the last session that uh, they would, um, if they felt they needed to uh, target their inflation target, um, allow or, or, or be there when uh, an auction uh, failed, that it wasn't their responsibility to, to stop an auction failing. Um, do you think in reality that um, the government would allow that level of independence from the bank? in the real world with debt over 100% of GDP? Well, I think, um, I mean, the, the, I, I'm with my um, my colleagues, former colleagues, and uh, that, um, you know, I don't think there's anything to particularly worry about at the moment. Um, and in many ways, British sort of central banking independence has grown up. You know, when the bank was made independent by Alistair's government, understandably, the bank wanted to really prove it was independent. Um, and, and was, you know, had a very sort of formal relationship with the Treasury and, and with chancellors. And then in, with recent governors, uh, that has become more informal. I saw that happen in my own relationship with Mervyn King and then, of course, with Mark Carney. And now you have, you know, the very excellent Andrew Bailey. You know, as the bank itself has got more confident about its independence, it hasn't had to kind of stand on ceremony. And I think that's very healthy. I think the kind of one question, which you know your your sort of question, it sort of implies, which is what happens when you when when a government starts to depend on the central bank as its as its sort of source of financing, not as an emergency, not as uh, you know quantitative easing in uh, the last ten years, uh, which Alistair started and I continued, or uh, what the bank's doing now around yield control, uh, yield curve control. And so but what happens, let's imagine fast water world three or four years time where, you know, there's no attempt to kind of um, bring the public finances back into order. There's just an assumption by whoever's the government that the bank will always be buying its debt. So it doesn't have to worry really about its kind of international credibility and whether its bond auctions fail or succeed. You know, I think that's where you potentially get a risk. And this is not by any means something specific to this country. I think we've got more credible institutions here than, than others. But, uh, you know, central banking is changing and we're moving away from a world of kind of, inf you know, the sort of academic institution on the hill that set the inflation target and that was it, into a world where it was already in, because of the financial crisis, deeply enmeshed in the banking system. Now in, enmeshed in the financing of many governments in the West. And, you know, I think, Kind of institutions, protocols, parliamentary scrutiny will have to change to uh, to catch up and, and, and keep the pace with it. Okay, can I um, cast your mind back then to when you changed the remit for the bank back in 2013 and you made it easier for them to temporarily prioritise growth over inflation in exceptional circumstances? And clearly, I think everyone would agree we're in exceptional circumstances at the moment. Can you recall if that change was initiated by the bank at the time 
Well, I think it came out of a, from memory, I'm happy, you know, if, I, if my memory's failed me to, to write later, but the, um, it was, came out of a discussion uh, after a period of quite high inflation. In fact, one of the toughest times I had as chancellor, which is just a reminder of a, a world we thought we'd left behind a very long time ago, a world of inflation. My toughest years as chancellor was when inflation rocketed, um, driven by a very high increase in the oil price. And, um, and, and, you know, the bank, I think quite sensibly at the time, and this was their independent judgment of the MPC, looked through the inflation target in, and didn't raise rates at a time when obviously that would have been terrible for an economy just coming out of uh, the financial crash. Um, and the, the remit was partly you know, a, a reflection of what was already happening. And was also partly a reflection from memory that the bank was taking on responsibilities for the financial system. And obviously, you know, I wanted to make sure that in the regulation of the financial system, obviously one way to regulate financial systems that never fails is not to have one. Um, but you also had to have a financial system that was providing credit into the economy as the way we've just discussed in this session. And that, that had to be the bottom line. Sounds as though that was probably initiated uh, by you, former chancellor, but um, I appreciate if you can follow up with a, with a letter, but I, I want to just move on to, to Alistair and ask him uh, one, because uh, his perspective is the longest um, a, a going post, um, that do you think that we've now got institutions that are robust enough um, that there would be an outcry that would, if a, if a future chancellor were to change uh, the Bank of England's inflation target for politically expedient reasons? Well, yeah, it, it depends on the circumstances and, you know, when, when you're talking about, uh, because, you know, I think all three of us have said we've all had to deal with different um, economic circumstances. And, you know, at some point in the future, you know, there's always been a debate about uh, whether you know, the, the central bank should be targeting growth as opposed to inflation. Um, uh, and, you know, naturally when inflation's at rock bottom, then you know, that, that's a, a live debate. But I think, I think the independence of the central bank is important. Uh, well, again, um, again, then on that, um, if they were to, because you heard what the, the governor said at the last session about not ruling out negative rates. So, you know, if you were chancellor and negative rates were on the table, is that something that you would see um, them engaging with the chancellor on or would that be something that they would do completely independent of government? Well, the, the bank has the power to fix rates, but I think it's um, it's inconceivable that Andrew Bailey and uh, the Chancellor wouldn't sit down to discuss the implications of and, that. And so, if they did it, would 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 you support it? Well, I I, I, I have some difficulty in that. I, I'm just wondering the, what the effect would be on banks, and then mm. the political problem you've got: Are you going to exempt savers from you know, mm. the pensioner who's got some money in the bank? Are they going to have a negative rate? Um, I, so I mean, that, that doesn't sound like a strong um, support for it. Philip, would you support it? I think this must be um, a decision for the Bank of England. And as a chancellor in office, um, you've got to be very careful uh, to protect the independence of the Bank of England and commenting on monetary policy decisions, um, cr I I implicitly criticising or supporting a decision of the Bank of England isn't appropriate. I mean, I, I hope I did this. I always intended to be strictly neutral. And when the bank made an, a pronouncement of any kind in its area of responsibility, simply to note that this is an area uh, for the bank uh, to make decisions within the remit that the government has given it. Sorry to have to crack through the questions so fast, but I'm out of time as well. Thank you, Harriet, and thanks for your understanding. Can I go to Alison now, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've got some questions in the area I think you all were hoping to avoid, and I wanted to ask a little bit about Brexit um, and the impact that um, coronavirus is going to have on that. So firstly, I'd like to ask uh, Philip Hammond um, about the, the impact of the coronavirus break, uh, outbreak on the cost of the EU leaving the, leaving the UK leaving the EU transition period uh, without a deal relative to the status quo because of the impact um, of the way that trade flows. Um, any further comments on that? <coughs> Well, I mean, it's no secret that I've always been a strong advocate of uh, the UK having the closest possible trade relationship with the European Union. That isn't out of any kind of sentimentality. It's out of an observation that for better or for worse, over 45 years, our economy has shaped itself around 
um, a, a close trading relationship um, with the European Union and complex interconnected supply chains. And my observation would be that uh, in the second half of this year, hopefully, the UK economy is going to be recovering from an extremely painful economic shock. And uh, in that, we're going to be in, we're going to have that in common with many of our competitor economies. To place ourselves at a disadvantage by then having a second shock um, later this year would not be helpful. So I'm very supportive of the government's stated objective of getting a uh, good trade deal done with the European Union. But I think there are some real challenges, some practical challenges around bandwidth um, and around the inability, inability to travel. And I do wonder whether it might be possible for the government to agree at least a temporary um, uh, trade deal with the European Union, which is perhaps not satisfactory to them in the long term, um, but something that would allow us uh, at least more time to negotiate the full-scale trade deal and respecting uh, the fact that the government's made a clear political decision that it is not prepared to extend the transition. Um, there has to be a way of avoiding placing an additional challenge for the recovering UK economy later this year. So would it be your feeling that the UK doesn't have um, the capacity at the moment to negotiate that trade deal to, to do all the things that it needs to do before um, the end of the year? Well, I don't think it's just the UK. I think that, um, uh, you know, obviously the government here uh, has as its number one priority managing the coronavirus crisis. Governments across Europe are in the same place. The EU itself is facing quite a lot of internal challenges, um, partly as a result of the coronavirus crisis, um, partly as a result of the German Constitutional Court. Um, and you know, this is not the ideal environment to be trying to reach a long-term uh, deal that will shape um, the relationship between the UK and its most important trading partner for decades to come. And if there was a way of um, doing something which is uh, quick and dirty, as it were, a, a simple arrangement, which may not suit either party as a long-term settlement, but which is an acceptable temporary stopgap, um, that may be the best way forward. Do you think it would be simpler to extend the transition period? Well, the government's um, ruled that out uh, as a matter of policy. And um, rather than sort of bang on a closed door, um, I, I would rather suggest another way forward if it is not possible to get an all singing, all dancing deal done over the next few months. Uh, I would urge the government to think about some kind of interim trade deal, which at least avoids um, a second shock to the economy later this year. OK, thank you. And what do you feel the, the kind of best outcome for the financial sector um, would be post Brexit? Um, well, I think in the, the, the best realistic outcome um, is going to be um, an expanded equivalence regime. Um, and I think that it is possible to negotiate such an arrangement, but it will only be possible in the context of a broader uh, deal that feels like uh, uh, something that works for both sides. I think um, if we're looking at a minimalist um, trade deal in general terms, it will be very difficult to then get a financial services deal, which really underpins and protects our financial services industry's trade with the European Union. Okay, and if I could expand this out to, um, to Mr. Osborne as well. Um, scenarios were produced about um, the impact of leaving the UK leaving the EU. All of these kind of scenarios are now kind of drowned out by the impact of coronavirus. Um, do you think it's important that the government knows the impact of the UK leaving the EU um, in these circumstances? Uh, yes, is the short answer. Um, I mean, there was, you know, I, I produced, um, when I was Chancellor, and it was pretty controversial at the time because it was called the referendum, some forecasts, including a medium-term forecast of the impact on the UK of leaving the um, EU and what would happen with different types of uh, future arrangements, like a free trade deal or EFTA or whatever. And, you know, I couldn't help but notice a couple of years later when a government now committed to Brexit, 
produced a similar kind of analysis. They came up with a very similar result. And indeed, the, everyone who's looked internationally at the uh, British economy has come to the conclusion, you know, that we've already lost, I guess, I think it's around two and a half percent GDP over what we would have had if we hadn't uh, taken the choice we had. But we've made that choice. But I, you know, there's no point not commissioning the analysis. You, you can commission the analysis and, by the way, choose for very good other reasons. You know, maybe you want to take back control of parliamentary sovereignty, for example, you know, and... And you want to weigh that against the economic costs. Those are perfectly reasonable things to do. But at least you, you know, I might not support them, but they're reasonable sort of political judgments. But do it with the analysis in front of you. Okay. And would you think that uh, uh, an extension to the transitions period or some other thing is wise, sensible in the circumstances? Uh, well, I, I tell you what I think is going to happen, which is, I don't know if that answers your question. I, you know, I think they'll have a deal, but it'll just be a deal to go on dealing. It'll, you know, both sides, neither side wants to go off a cliff not least because of what's happened with COVID. But at least equally, both sides have revealed, including this current British government and current British Prime Minister, that they don't want to take the economy off a cliff. And this was pre the recession we're now in. And so I think we'll end up with something that is called a trade agreement by the end of the year, but it's actually just an agreement to go on talking about this sector and that sector and whatever. And um, so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm more optimistic, I think, than quite a few people that we'll avoid that cliff edge. Okay, thank you. And um, lastly, to, to Alistair Darling, there's a new study from the Scottish Government out today that says without a, an extension, Scottish GDP could be up to 1.1% lower after two years. And I wonder what your thoughts would be about an extension or a deal or what the, the government would do if, if you were in charge of this scenario. Well, look, um, I, I largely I agree with what um, uh, George and Philip have said. Um, you know my view. I think it was a profound mistake, but I accept the result of the referendum and we just have to move on from there. Um, I think a no deal would be absolutely disastrous. You know, with everything we're going through with COVID, you'd have to be mad to want to end up in a situation uh, where you, you, you erect huge trade barriers and tariffs uh, you know, just at the time when you're hoping your economy might be beginning to recover. Um, I Certainly my experience with the EU uh, is that um, if you can get some sort of deal uh, that's acceptable, they would do it. And uh, George Osborne's suggestion there that um, perhaps uh, the deal will be a deal to carry on talking, uh, you know, can't be ruled out. Uh, but then I can't get into the mind of the Prime Minister, so I have no idea where he's going to end up. I can't believe that he actually wants to take those risk, uh, because people will notice it. Uh, and but as for you know the loss to GDP, yes, as you know, there's lots of estimates there. Of course, it'll have an effect, and the whole UK is in Scotland included. But if they can reach a good deal, good and well. But my guess is it'll one of these. So you see, I've lived through a lot of them in my time when I dealt with the European Union. It'll be a sort of deal that everybody will say, "Isn't this great?" Uh, but it means you're coming back to the table the next week to carry on talking. However, talking is better than breaking off relations. Yes. And you'd said uh, earlier about sort of international cooperation being particularly important. And uh, do you think that the coronavirus will also have an impact on the trade deals potentially that the UK could make in, during this time period? I'm not so sure about that because international trade deals tend to take years to put together. Um, you know, the frequently cited example is the one that we've got with Canada at the moment, which took the best part of seven years um, to negotiate. So, and hopefully the virus will be, you know, under control long before then. Um, no, I, I think the bigger, biggest agreement with, with trade deals is that, you know, the, the countries will look at us and say well, they need to do a deal and, you know, we'll, we'll take as long as it takes. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you may see, you know, for the United States, for example, you may see one of these uh, breakthrough deals that isn't quite what it seems, but, you know, you live to fight another day. But I don't think the virus will affect them so much. I think we should look at the virus will have an economic effect on us. And I think the fact that we have broken a big trade deal and are seeking to replace it with an awful lot of others, with an awful lot of discussions to take place is going to, um, is going to take some time and it will cause, you know, harm to us. Uh, naturally in the near term as nobody can fly to meet anywhere else meet anyone else and despite the wonders of zoom i don't think they're great for negotiating trade deals okay thank, thank you. you very much and th thank you alison over to steve please thank you all very much indeed for coming it's a real privilege to have you here i'd like to take advantage of your uh, considerable expertise by asking you about machinery of government and how 
some of these decisions are taken as we go through recovering from this COVID crisis. So can I ask you, how important do you think it is that the Treasury maintains a degree of independence from number 10? Um, perhaps I might come to uh, Alistair Darling first. Um, yeah, I would I think a broader point. Yes, I do think that the Treasury and the Prime Minister, you know, the, the Prime Minister office, there's two separate functions there. Remember, the Prime Minister is the first amongst equals. Uh, you know, it's not a presidential system. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I understand, you know, I've worked with two Prime Ministers, the frustration that they sometimes have that you know, actually the number 10 office is very small. Now, the cabinet office is really, you know, a place, you know, it's, it's a gather up place for lots of other functions in the government. And they sometimes feel, well, we don't know what's going on in the Treasury or in other places as well. But at the end of the day, if the Chancellor doesn't like what's going on in the Treasury, he's got the ultimate power to hire and fire. Uh, and, but um, the idea that you can have the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer as a sort of, you know, almost the equivalent of a paid up civil servant just to do what, you know, number 10 wants, that's not how our constitution works. And it shouldn't be to try to, 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 to work that way. Ministers are accountable to Parliament. I think all governments are healthier if there is constructive tension there, uh, robust discussions between colleagues. Uh, you know, it, it, it reflects well on the Prime Minister. But uh, you can't, it, this is not a presidential system. And all these analogies to, you know, what's happened and how other governments work, I think are wholly inappropriate. The other thing is that relatively unusual actually, and I'm sure Jordan Philip would notice this, that um, many uh, finance ministers in Europe are not elected. You know, they are there to serve the prime minister. I know one of them asking me, how can you take decisions if you've got to think of the voters? And I would say, well, how on earth can you take decisions if you don't? Well, thank you very much. I must just press you before I come to George Osborne on the characterization that you use there. I mean, are, are you really suggesting that the present chancellor is, is there as I think you said, was a paid up civil servant to do the bidding of number 10. It, does that seem to be the implication of what you said? No, I, I, was, I, I was not saying that. And, you know, for the avoidance of doubt, I think that uh, the present Chancellor has been doing a very good job in the, the time that he's been appointed. I suppose my remarks were more prompted uh, by the events of last week, uh, uh, where you've got a, a special advisor, because that's all he is to the Prime Minister, at least <laughs> that's what he's supposed to be, all he is to the Prime Minister. This idea that all the other special advisors, including the ones in the Treasury, would be subservient to him. And, you know, that, that's really what I was getting at. Great. Well, that, that's a relief because I think the present Chancellor is doing a fantastic job too. George, could I turn to you? And I'll, I'll, you had a, a famously close relationship with uh, David Cameron. Could I ask you, what, what is your reflection on the need for a degree of independence uh, at the Treasury? Yeah, I, th I think um, it's good to see you, Steve. You too. Um, <laughs> it, um, it's, uh, I think Prime Ministers are stronger themselves when they're more comfortable with a semi-independent treasury and a strong chancellor alongside them. You know, I think of the sort of Margaret Thatcher at her best was when she had a pretty independent-minded Nigel Lawson doing a lot of the great sort of Thatcher reforms. I think, you know, the most successful period of the Blair government was when uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown were working well together in those first few years. And, you know, and I think the Cameron government you know, well, you could, you know, you'd have to ask him, but, you know, I think, you know, he, he was able to do the things he wanted to because he knew he was the first Lord of the Treasury, but he didn't have to constantly prove it because he knew he had a Chancellor who respected that, but was also getting on and, and delivering on the agenda. And I think Prime Ministers who are anti-Treasury come a cropper, not that I can think of anyone recently. Would you have accepted a common pool of advisors when you were Chancellor of the Exchequer? Well, I... I you know, I, I mean, uh, I thought Sajid Javid was placed in an impossible situation, um, frankly. Um, and as far as I can see, you know, it was sort of no one expected him to resign and it was a big cock up. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, in, you know, some of my, you know, my advisors were actually also advisors to the prime minister. You know, and um, that's when it really works well. Um, so it's, it's, you know, now... You know, you, you want that a bit of tension. And look, ultimately, the Treasury is, you know, often the sort of the department in the room that has to say no. You know, it has to say, unfortunately, we can't afford that. And, you know, sometimes that, that that's, an un, uh, that's a sort of lonely function. And sometimes the prime minister's job is to overrule the chancellor. You know, I think chancellors also need to accept that they are, to, at this point, part of a team. And 
sometimes there's a broader judgment for the government that actually we do need to spend this money, you know, or this, you know, audacious tax rise that the <laughs> Chancellor's proposed is going to, you know, hold the government below the waterline. Or, you know, um, indeed, Chancellors are also paying close attention to their chief whips as well. So, the, you know, I, I think that it's, it's sort of everyone understanding their role in the system. And, and obviously, you know, politics is also about personality. It doesn't always work out like that. But I think actually, you know, Rishi Sunak is maneuvering what is, let's be honest, quite a complicated situation and relationship by just getting on and doing the job well yeah. and then and coming up with the ideas. Thank you, know. you very much. Uh, Philip, you were nodding along in agreement at the idea of the lonely task of, of the Treasury to, yeah. to, to say no. Would, would you like to elaborate on that point? And I, I, in particular, I'm wondering whether the Treasury might have lost something on that point by becoming a bit closer to number 10. Yeah, so I agree with what um, George has said, and I agree with Alistair's point that there needs to be some tension between number 10 and number 11. A prime minister doesn't need a bunch of yes men around him or yes women. What he needs are people who will challenge him, put the counter arguments. But as George said, and George has said many times to me when he was chancellor, um, you know, you do all this, never forgetting who is actually the boss. And in the end, once you've said your bit, you've presented your arguments, you've made your case, if you are overruled by the prime minister, then the prime minister is the prime minister and the prime minister's view prevails. But if number 10 and number 11 are too close together, then it will not be possible for the, for the chancellor to even make those coherent um, arguments. And prime ministers and chancellors come at issues from different perspectives. Prime ministers have often very focused on uh, the, the, the public view of the government and the um, delivery of overall strategic objectives. Chancellors are often um, focused on some of the warning bells that will be ringing in their own, um, in their own cellar. So I, I do think that keeping enough distance to be able to provide strong independent advice um, and then acquiescing if having done it, you are overruled, is the right relationship between Prime Minister and Chancellor. I'll just say one other thing, Steve, that Alistair mentioned the very small size of the Prime Minister's um, office at the centre of government. And I think all Prime Ministers look at the Treasury as part of the centre of government and see disproportionate muscle. Too many people in the Treasury um, compared to the number of people in the Prime Minister's office, Cabinet office team. Um, and, 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 in, and that sometimes provokes um, a reaction. But the Treasury is, is, is a tool to be used by the centre of government in delivering the policy objectives and doing them in a sustainable way. Well, I'm down to my last question, I think, in order to finish. Could I ask you all, would you have tweeted support for the Prime Minister's chief advisor when he was in the difficulty he was in? Was that something that surprised you or could you imagine yourselves doing it as Chancellor? Perhaps I could start with Alistair, since you're most distant from this. Well, I'm all right, because I certainly wouldn't have been sending uh, a tweet. And <clears throat> I think, uh, apart from a few few short months on the Scottish referendum campaign, I have never knowingly tweeted. Never knowingly tweeted. George, you tweet. I've seen you. I follow you. You follow me. We've occasionally perhaps needled each other. Would you have tweeted support for Rishi? Mm. For, yeah, we have, as Rishi did. We had, some, had some, we had some success helping Rob Halfon vote in the last 24 hours, thanks to Twitter. Um, um, but, you know, I, the, the thing about that, I would have said it's a bloody stupid idea to get us all to tweet because it's just going to reveal what a crisis we've got in the middle of the government. You know, and if, if you all issue suddenly all these tweets about the Prime Minister's special advisor, it tells you one thing, which is the special advisor's clinging on. Since we're running out of time, Philip, I won't put you on the spot unless you want to leap in. Otherwise... Well, I'll just say one thing. When I see lots of tweets from ministers that all say the same thing, I can easily envisage that there was an earlier tweet from the chief whip suggesting yeah. how ministers might want to tweet. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much, all of you. It's been a pleasure and I very much appreciate it. And we've all finished smiling, so that's a good, a good forward step. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. And finally, uh, going to Mike, please. It's my ah, oh, Mike. I think you need to unmute yourself. There you go. There you go. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. It's been uh, an interesting uh, session for me. Um, 
I'd like to touch on the future prospects uh, for, for the UK. Um, the crisis, the COVID crisis has thrown up a lot of conundrums. Uh, Rushinara touched on child poverty, there's issues of mental health and stress, there's uh, environmental issues. Uh, George, you said there's a real apartheid in this country um, uh, uh, around uh, education and access to equipment. All of that is in the mix. And some countries, um, in particular Iceland that we've been looking at, uh, and New Zealand have begun to develop, uh, and Scotland as well, um, have begun to develop well-being budgets to incorporate um, well-being uh, 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 as well as economic growth. So I, I'd just like to ask the general question, uh, please, and starting um, with um, Philip, if that's okay. Uh, given the focus on mortality rates uh, because of COVID, is it time for the Treasury now to focus on a wider set of measures of welfare rather than just economic growth? And if so, would it be difficult to wean the Treasury off traditional measures of economic growth? And how can that be done? And well, I don't think the, the Treasury um, only looks uh, at economic growth. Um, but it's interesting you mentioned Iceland and New Zealand, both countries with significantly higher GDP per capita yeah. than we have in the UK. Um, and, and obviously, continuing to grow your GDP per capita ad infinitum is, is perhaps not um, in everybody's interest or anybody's interest. Um, but there will be an awful lot of people uh, in this country um, who feel uh, that at the at present levels of income, they need this economy to be growing. They need to see a path to raising their earnings, their standards of living, um, to seeing their children having better prospects than they have. Um, it is a luxury that we should definitely aspire to, but I fear we may not be there yet, to be able to be willing to sacrifice um, some economic growth in order to achieve uh, some other goods. Um, but I'm, I would be wary of um, letting the system off, as it were, being accountable for delivering on the objective that we've set it. And for me, I'm sorry to be repetitive, but at the very end of this session, the clear objective of the Treasury and the economic part of government, for me, should be to raise productivity so that we have rising living standards in this country. What about Alistair? What's your opinion? Um, well, for, firstly, you know, don't knock growth, uh, not least because we haven't got much of it at the moment. In fact, there's a distinct lack of it. And when it comes to people's well-being, uh, you know, how much they get paid, the fact whether in job uh, in a job or not, uh, the you know the availability of public services and so on, they add to your general well-being, which is really, I suppose, the, the bigger point. That um, you know, I, I, I've I've seen you know. You know, examples of countries setting up a well-being fund, and it's a bit right. A few years ago, um, someone advocated we should have a happiness index. I was just wondering how on earth you could construct an index where everybody was happy, um, and the, what everyone, everybody thought was a good thing. Uh, but so, and I think the other thing that I, I would say to Mike is that, uh, you know, I spent 13 years um, uh, in the cabinet, and um, you know, frankly. I would rather the government concentrated on a few things that it did well than starting to go into areas where I'm far from convinced it would actually make a difference. And you know, the, the more general the aim, the less likely you are to deliver it. I think. So, George, you, you were you were uh, behind the Northern Powerhouse. Uh, my constituency is, is is part of that, part of the form, part of the green technology agenda, which I think is very exciting. And we've got we've got to develop some kind. We've got some social responsibility, haven't we? What was your opinions on this? Yeah, I think. Well, I actually we did um, introduce a general well-being index, um, and I think we, um, we it, it came from Bhutan as the original idea, um, and I think the ONS does produce it. And I actually think it's not sort of um, airy fairy as it sounds. It's it's actually quite a good guide to also to how people feel in the country, whether they're optimistic about the future. And I think the Treasury and the rest of government very regularly, indeed, almost always prior, will, will sometimes trump economic efficiency with some broader social goal. 
it'll redirect resources around the country to poorer areas. It will um, help poorer, um, more disadvantaged people. This pandemic is a great example of, of, you know, not putting sort of GDP first, if you like. Uh, so I think governments exist, but to often, you know, take those decisions to intervene in markets and avoid the outcomes that a pure free market if ever such a thing could be constructed. I'm not sure you would ever have a free market without a government setting the rules of the game anyway, but you know, in theory that a government that have sort of untrammeled free market would deliver. So, you know, I think in, in, we already have that kind of thing. Maybe we're not as good as uh, Iceland, Bhutan or New Zealand. That's it. Maybe. I've not been in New Zealand. I've been to Iceland. It's beautiful. Um, so my next question would in, in reverse. So George, uh, again, uh, what will be the key challenges for nations where low rates of productivity uh, and economic growth are the norm? Well, the biggest one, I mean, Philip's been quite rightly um, re re repeatedly telling us about this productivity. It's such a boring word. I remember, you know, the chamber would kind of fall asleep when in one of my budgets I got onto the productivity <laughs> section. But it's, but it's incredibly important because it drives improvements in living standards which are ultimately, as Alistair was saying, of, you know, an important component of many people's happiness. Um, so, you know, I, you know, that kind of pushing back, trying to find ways to um, make our economies more productive seems to me the sort of central task and challenge ahead. Okay, thank you. Alistair, so Alistair, during the lockdown, there was an increase in remote working and the country had lower rates of air pollution. Is it feasible for the government to sustain those trends to the medium term, given that it also has to stimulate the economy? I think working habits will change. It, you know, if people had said at the beginning of this year, can you operate with 90% of your staff not at work, not in the office rather, uh, they'd say, no, that would be impossible. But, you know, a number of businesses are doing that. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's almost certain that you know, over the, not maybe not immediately, but you know, over the next few years, people were saying, "Well, do I really need to have such a big big office?" You know, it's, it, this trend was starting anyway. However, I would say this that I think one of the things the lockdown has also shown is, um, you know, that the instinct for us as humans to meet each other uh, and to work with each other is pretty strong. And you know, a lot of people have said, "Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to the office, and I can function doing Zoom meetings and all the rest of it." But you can't beat the casual conversation, you know, when you're making coffee or talking to someone across your desk. Uh, so I think the idea that we'll all end up just working in our homes, if that was possible, um, I think is fanciful. But it's it's bound to have an effect, and equally, you know, it will occur to people that you don't need to necessarily fly, fly around the world for endless meetings or even travel you know, long distances for meetings, um, uh, which have a knock-on effect to the transport industry and the hotel industry and so on. So yes, it will have an effect, but at this stage, it's terribly difficult to be certain about anything. Uh, and uh, you know, But I think it's an assumption that people will make that yes, more people will be working at home from time to time. Uh, but remember that in itself can cause difficulty with people with children and so on. But as I say, human contact is you're talking about happiness and so on and uh, you know well-being <coughs> contact is very much part of that right. also, and at leisure thank you very much um philip um e even before the uk crisis growth and productivity was sluggish with the highest annual growth rate since recession being 2.6 percent in 2014 do you expect these growth rates to be the new normal if not, how can the UK stimulate growth and productivity into the future? Well, it is about productivity. I mean, the, the, the growth rates we're talking about, the lower growth rates, reflect a lower trend rate of growth, which is a function of our productivity. And one of, um, unfortunately, one of the things driving um, the productivity conundrum is the um, demographics. Uh, the population um, is aging, the proportion of people in work um, uh, the, the proportion of people um, uh, in work will decline as the population um, ages. So um, focusing on that challenge, how we, because actually the response to an aging population has to be that we need the working part of the population to become even more productive because we've got essentially a smaller working population supporting a larger non-working um, population. So we have to focus all our effort on 
uh, ensuring that we do deliver higher productivity. How do we do that? I mean, if we knew the answer to that, we would have solved the problem a long time ago. But if we look at the UK's problem compared to many other similar countries, we can identify a, a few things. Um, we've had very poor levels of um, uh, intermediate technical education, something that we've addressed with the introduction of um, T levels. We have a very highly centralized system, and I think we probably all agreed during this call that greater devolution is likely to lead um, to higher productivity. Uh, we've got, by the standards of our competitors, um, low levels of private as well as public investment. Chancellors have done, um, over the last few years, have done something about both, trying to stimulate private investment, um, but also increasing in public investment in productive in pr productivity enhancing um, infrastructure um, uh, training um, uh, we have uh, a less good track record of training people with employment skills than many of our competitors so um, we can see uh, and and the regional divide um, trying to uh, close the gap between well London West Inner is the most productive sub-region uh, within the European Union plus the UK, but the UK also has some of the least productive sub-regions within it. So closing that gap, um, which is probably bigger in the UK between the most productive and the least productive than in any other European country, closing that gap has got to be key. And that's why many of the initiatives that this government um, announced before the crisis around investing in the more deprived parts of the country are part of the solution. They're not just some kind of good works. They are part of the solution to Britain's productivity challenge. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, my time's up. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, I, I would like to just end with one very quick question <laughs> of our three panelists. And I, I would like a one sentence answer if that is possible. You have all been through moments of crisis when you were in office and certainly uh, extreme uh, challenge. There's Rishi Sunak, he's burning the midnight oil, he's in the Treasury seven days a week until midnight, etc. What is your one sentence or two, maybe, of advice to the Chancellor today? And could I start, please, with Alistair Darling? Be your own man. Thank you very much. George? Uh, don't get frazzled and keep your eye on the long term. Okay, very good, thank you. Philip? stick to your principles recognize that you might have to do some short-term things that challenge them but in the medium to long term stick to your principles great thank you very much indeed to everybody and uh, perhaps uh, i think it was steve who said it was uh, a privilege to have you all here and that's exactly how i feel about uh, the session today and to see you uh, all uh, interacting with the uh, committee um, i've had a sense of drawing on a fairly deep well of experience and uh, quite a lot of wisdom as well. Um, what has struck me in these very uncertain times, actually, and perhaps rather comfortingly, is that it seems to be quite a high level of consensus, actually, on the broad principles of how we should both address the short term uh, and emerging out in the longer term uh, from this crisis. So can I thank uh, each of you uh, from the whole committee for having been so incredibly generous with your time. We've really enjoyed you uh, being with us, and it's been extremely uh, useful as well. So thank you all very much indeed. Uh, and uh, on that note, uh, that concludes uh, this session. Order, order. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.